Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to this uh, meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee for Monday, April 1st, 2019. I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. Bon Bonin and Mr. Price, and we're ready to begin today's meeting. We have a full house today, and then some, so I wanted to kind of go over how the meeting will go for um, for those of you who haven't been to a Budget and Finance Committee meeting before, um, we have a number of closed session items. Uh, these are legal matters that will not be heard in open session. So um, because we have a full house in here, the committee will be moving to our overflow room to take up the closed session items so that you can all remain seated and don't have to be asked to leave the room. Um, so we'll be doing that right after we take um, some public comment on those matters. We'll be saving uh, general public comment, which means comment pertaining to something, to anything that's not on today's agenda. That will be reserved until the end of the meeting. Um, but we will be taking public comment on all of the agenda items uh, as they come up. The one exception to that is because we have a limit on the number the total amount of time that a, a speaker can speak on multiple items, we usually take up at the beginning those speakers who um, have signed up to speak on more than two items um, so that we can have them finished and then proceed with uh, the items that uh, we'll be voting on. Um, I do just, and by the way, if anybody wants to speak but who hasn't yet signed up at the kiosk in the back, um, we have a kiosk in that corner that's where you sign up uh, to, to, be as, uh, to be a speaker, and um, one of our sergeants can help you if you need any help with figuring that part out. I do have to you know, kind of say this at the outset. There are four, almost four million people who live in this city, um, and yet invariably at every one of our committee meetings and council meetings, there are a tiny handful of people who sometimes come to our meetings and um, exercise their speech rights in a way that may be highly offensive to some of you. Um, it certainly is to us, and so I want to apologize to you in advance for um, those sorts of abuses of uh, people's rights, um, but it is something that sort of comes with the territory uh, when you're in public service. It doesn't necessarily come with the territory when you're just trying to express your points of view as a member of the public. And so for that, let me just apologize in advance for the almost certainly offensive things that you may be hearing today. So, um, yes. I just, I, I see there's a lot of new folks in the room and I appreciate the, 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 the warning. I just want folks to, to really understand what Mr. Krikorian is saying. There sometimes are people who come up and they will use the N-word uh, and they will use other forms of, of, of speech that are insulting to groups of people, uh, uh, gays, for instance. But uh, I just want you to know it, it is that offensive, so you're not shocked. All right. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bonin. Okay, so members, I would have recommended item number 12 for consent approval, but we do have uh, a couple of speakers on that matter. So I'm going to call first our uh, multiple item speakers. So let me just get this one out of the way first. Is there anyone named Juan Vargas here? I didn't think so. So uh, let's go ahead and call Mr. Previn up first followed by Mr. Herman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I, I really don't appreciate that introduction because I do not uh, use that language and it is extremely offensive to marinate speak, the room. Speak like to that. the agenda items. What you're offended I'm, I'm by is to, irrelevant to you've me. Got speak some to the agenda sidewalk, items. Uh, vending enforcement coming out. Got your contingent from the seated cannabis group who are happy to have some enforcement against the illegal, and I think that there's a measure of reasonableness to that. You've got your Vision Zero item, which I got to tell you, uh, I've told you before, sir, on Colfax and Witsit, increasing from 35 to 40 miles an hour, you can spin your ideas about the state legislature. 
people are going to get hurt in our neighborhood. So we're not going to increase it to 40. You ought to tell Salida Reynolds and DOT not to do it because it's right through an area where people travel and people could get hurt. Now, as for Myers Nave, and a lot of people are here to talk about the item nine, which is the uh, Santa Susana matter. Myers Nave is your in house, and I asked McWilliams, maybe I'll like to hear, I won't speak on that item now, I'd like to hear about the conflict between Myers Nave and the city on that, because, you know, the Myers Nave is your in house deflavorization firm. They are the ones who spent 1.4 million of our taxpayer dollars fighting against public comment stuff, against people I don't even know. They spent um, a fortune on the CEQA panel, which is where Mr. McWilliams did his magic and came up with a way for this firm to um, take money from developers in order to crush community groups, just like this community. They're out here fighting because they believe that the dirt is toxic and needs to be carted off. And obviously Greg Smith is here to help cart it off with some trucks and some friends who are going to make sure that that stuff takes a nice, long, clean truck ride away. <laughs> but let's not rush to judgment. Let's see whether or not Mr. Kretz and others want to put together some private funding because to take this to the city to fund a litigation where we just lost on appeal under Andrea Sheridan Orden's leadership and storm whatever and was Look, everybody wants an environmentally safe region, including the people who are here today, but we do not want to waste taxpayer funds and we do not want these, um, these uh, opportunistic lawyers ruling the day. All right. Thank you, Mr. Previn. Uh, Mr. Herman. Willits versus Los Angeles. Fuck you, Bonin. First of all, since you are the transportation nigger. Because street services reports that there are no long-term, near-term, or short-term for sidewalk vending programs because we still see vending on the sidewalks, in which Measure 64 pushes us to say, yes, we want more cannabis sales directly on our sidewalks with the permit, jackass. Because it's the voters who decide what's good for the people. It is the voters who decide what is bad or poor for the people. But if people want to smoke their fucking cannabis, let them have their free speech and fucking smoke as much as they want. Because none of us have to listen to your bullshit. Neither one of you guys come out with this bullshit presentation about how you're challenging the system. Fuck your system. It is our system. We the people. And we the people navigate the legislative body on how we want shit to fuck work with us. You got it? And apparently you don't got it because motherfuckers, you look stupid and defounded by what dub nigger me Two has to say about you, fools. So when you decide to tax people simply for more money because you're so fucking stupid, if you look at all these lawsuits that are pending here, Woods versus Los Angeles, I hope that sidewalk incident and trip and fall, they pay out $1.5 million. And the other bicycle incident, pay them two point five million. Because jackasses like you... Elected officials at your capacity are so fucking stupid. It's no shame and no wonder why I have to say fuck you. All right. Um, again, is there anybody named Juan Vargas here or was that just a silly sophomoric joke? Looks like it was that. Okay. Um, is there a Chamel Bow? All right. Um, Mr. Smith, uh, we are going to be going into closed session uh, before we uh, take up uh, the matter that you're here on. Would you like to say anything before we go in? Or you get, you're going to join us in closed session? Okay, that's fine. Um, okay. So was there anybody else here who was speaking on more than two matters? I don't have anybody on my list. I, I want to say something. Yeah, Don't thank you. Thank neither, you, sir. Neither do we. I mean, nobody said that. I mean, thank you, sir. If one of us up here said the other word, it would be an issue. I'm not going to sit here. I don't care about nobody else. No okay, sir, sir, here, thank you, sir. I'm not going to tolerate Thank you, sir. I'm just letting you know. Thank you. You'll need to take that. You'll need... You, well, okay, folks, you all need to take that I'm up with the speaker. I'm letting you know that. I'm letting you know that as okay. a United States voice.
Or okay, now, American citizens. now, sir, I'm sorry, but you're disrupting the meeting. I'm not so I, I don't need you to disrupt the meeting. No, I'm not being dis rude or disrespectful in any way. We have to tolerate listening to this at every single meeting because that's what the courts require of us. And so I, I get that it's offensive. That's why I said at the outset, it is highly offensive. And if I had my way, believe me, we wouldn't be listening to that. None of us would be listening to that. So, um, so I appreciate your comments, sir. And what I would ask, actually, what I would ask of you, sir, and anybody else who finds this offensive and who finds it uh, that it interferes with your ability to come in and participate in a public meeting, I would ask you to please let the city attorney know your feelings about this so that we can, you know, hear from the real members of the public about this as well. That would be what I would request of you. Uh, because I cannot tell you in strong enough terms how offensive. Mr. Herman, you will remain silent for the rest of the meeting. If I hear a sound from you, Mr. Herman, you will be asked to leave this meeting. One sound. We listen to this every single meeting, sir, and I, I, I apologize again that other members of the public have to listen to it. So um, with that, I think, are we prepared now to go into closed session? There was nobody else who wanted to speak on a closed session matter, I, I think, according to my records. So we're going to move so that you all can stay here, um, but we'll retire now to our closed session matters. So, um, those speakers, and I'm going to ask um, four of you to, no, three of you, we only have three chairs, three of you to come up at once, and then after you've spoken, if you could um, leave your seats to make room for other speakers, that would be great. So, our first speaker is Christina Walsh, followed by, uh, the, this card just says C-I-N-F, so I think that, I don't, I'm not sure if that, what that was followed by Danica Gortner, followed by Don Kowalski. So you can all start making your w way up. The record is item number nine is mo motion Smith Wesson relative to retaining and authorizing funding of up to $600,000 for the law firm Myers Navias outside counsel to engage in all work necessary to prosecute legal action to ensure that the Santa Susana Field Lab site be remediated in a manner consistent with prior counsel directive. So sorry about that. Thank you for the correction, Ms. Walsh. Thank you. I support item 190145. Six decades. That's how old this problem is. Nearly 10 years since the agreements were signed, and two years since the deadline for completion was missed. And yet no cleanup has happened, no promises have been kept, and our communities have been bullied and lied to. Despite decades of affirmations, they are now telling us a very different story, using false choices and manipulation. This should not be about relitigating promises that were signed a decade ago. And now, through the Woolsey fire, it has now been spread even, even further, especially because of regulatory failure. How many children is sad enough? NEPA requires that children be a top priority, and yet that was completely disregarded, and these 54 children were failed by this government and this city. So we thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it, did CINF make sense to anybody? Oh, that was my mom. She goofed. Uh, that's what I figured. <laughs> no problem. But you, but you do have your name in here. Uh, okay, great. We'll skip that one. So Danica Gortner, followed by Don Kowalski, who will be followed by Cindy Gortner. Well, I'm a little nervous. So Don't be nervous. It's I'm only 14 years old is the issue, so I'm, I'm scared. I Can you pull the mic a little closer? Cool. So is that good? Mm -hmm. My name is Danica Gortner, and I live near the Santa Susana Field Lab. I am very concerned about the Trump administration's efforts to break their cleanup agreement and leave 98% of the contamination on site. Please vote yes and help defend the cleanup agreement. That's what I was told to say by all of the adults that are saying, well, you know, you just sit down here, you say that, and then you're done. But I'm upset that I have to be here at all because I had to move when I was young. I have been fighting this organization that's, you know, fighting me and for 10 years since I was four. So I, I may not understand everything, but I know that I had to move my house 
because my mom thought it wasn't safe for me because people got cancer who lived in my neighborhood. And I want to move back. I love that house. I cried every night for weeks after we moved. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Um, our next speaker is Don Kowalski, followed by Cindy Gortner. Come on up. Um, and Holly Huff. Thank you. And thank you for the City Council for even coming to bat for us. Um, I've been involved in this for now um, 30 years when the news broke in May of, 70, of 89 that there were two-headed snakes swimming in greasy ponds up on the site. Um, I live right below the site. I've raised my daughters there. I have creeks running through my property. Uh, when the winds blow, it's scary because things are blowing off there. When the fires happen, scary. You know, we shouldn't live in fear. This has been 30 years. I thought when I started these meetings 30 years ago that it would just, it was the right thing to do. It would happen. But, you know, Boeing's powerful. They give a lot of money to everybody. And uh, we're just grateful that you're going to help support us and hopefully fight for us. Thank, thank you. you very and much. I'm sorry, you're Ms. Kowalski? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, our next speaker is Cindy Gortner, followed by Holly Huff, followed by Dory Raskin. Hi, I'm Cindy Gortner. I want to thank Council Member Smith and all of you for being here today, and I want to make sure my support for 190145 is very clear. I don't want you to let the Trump administration get away with not cleaning up the Santa Susana Field Lab. A um, couple things. I was in the room when the EPA announced the results of their $40 million study of the site. They found 500 places where there was still nuclear waste, radioactive waste. This is very close to children. Um, that's really important. It's not safe. It needs to be cleaned up. And right now, uh, the, the Trump administration wants to leave 98% of it there. So we, you need to be able to help us. Also, just follow the money. Boeing, NASA, DOE, they don't want to spend the money. Uh, there are good people there, and there are not so good people there. And we need to make sure that the good guys win, that the Trump administration doesn't win, and that the children are protected. I've been to many meetings where they talk about the plants. It's not about the plants or the animals. It's the kids. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Holly Huff, followed by Dory Raskin, followed by Janet Murphy. Uh, my name's Holly Huff. I live in the Simi Valley. I live just below the facility. I've lived next to the facility within the two-mile radius, <clears throat> excuse me, for the last 60 years. I was there within the two miles for the first meltdown ever in California, United States history. This place is filthy. It was supposed to be finished in 2007. Then the AOCs came in 2010. It was supposed to be finished in 2017. And now it's getting pushed under the rug again. There's many people that get sick from this facility. The fire, this isn't the first fire that's burned through there. And it's still in the soil. So every time a new plant grows, it takes it up into the leaves, burns off toward the beach. It needs to be cleaned. Unfortunately, if, we, if it has to, they're suing and tax money. That's very unfortunate because this should have been a long time ago. DTSC would have done their job. It would have been. Uh, I myself lived there my whole life. Um, was diagnosed with leukemia in 2009. I have the best kind you can have because it doesn't kill you right away, but I have it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Dory Raskin, followed by Janet Murphy. Hi, Dory Raskin. And we want the city to continue to defend the full cleanup of the Rocketdyne site or SSFL. Um, I appreciate your past support. I've been doing this for 30 years, my parents before me, and it's just disgusting that there's still contamination that we still haven't cleaned up, and people are getting uh, sick. There's kids, little kidder luck, children that are, are at risk, that have cancers, and uh, it's caused by the, the radiation and the chemicals that are coming off site. Um, I would appreciate it if you support 190145 and continue to defend uh, the community and uh, make the polluters clean up this toxic um, mess. Thank you very much. Thank you. And tell me your name again, I'm sorry. Dory Raskin. Okay, thank you. So our next speaker will be uh, Janet Murphy. Uh, and again, is there a Chamel Bow? 
Okay. Then, so it'll be Janet Murphy followed by Jenny Knack. Good afternoon, honorable members of the committee. I would like to express my gratitude for your continu continuing support for the full and safe cleanup of the Santa Susana Field Lab, as it was recently shown by the City Council's unanimous vote prior to this meeting. I truly believe our state is turning in a good direction, I sh especially with the new leadership of Jerry Blumenfield of the California EPA and within the toxic Department of Toxic Substance Control. These agencies are committed to the full cleanup and had told the Department of Ag Department of Energy, it must comply with the original agreement. Unfortunately, the Trump administration and the DOE has made it clear that they do not want to comply and now only want just 2% of the contamination to be removed. This is wrong. We can't let this happen. It is imperative that we can count on you to provide a funding source for our public defense since legal action may be needed in the DOE if the DOE doesn't uphold the agreements. I encourage you to approve the allocation up to the 600,000. Thank you again for your continued support. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker will be Jenny Knack, followed by Denise Duffield, followed by Melissa Bumstead. I live less than five miles from the lab. I strongly implore you to ensure that the AOC cleanup agreements concerning SSFL are upheld. On February 8th, the full city council approved a motion to retain legal counsel for litigation purposes to this end. I urge you to similarly support item 19-0145 today. The communities surrounding SSFL need the city to fight for us, to continue its history of support for the SSFL cleanup. As without a full cleanup, we will continue to be subjected to public health risks, as the Woolsey Fire has recently shown. Our communities have needed the remediation of this site for 60 years. We now have that su support at the state level with Jared Blumenfeld as Secretary of Cal EPA and the DTSC has communicated to DOE that it must comply with the AOC. Please show strong support at the city level by doing all that you can to represent the vast majority of citizens who are desperate for the cleanup to finally take place. Please vote yes on item 19-0145. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Denise Duffield, followed by Melissa Bumstead, followed by Luke Bumstead. Okay. My name is Denise Duffield. I'm the Associate Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility Los Angeles. Our organization has been working for the full cleanup of the field lab uh, for over 30 years. The cleanup was supposed to be complete in 2017, but the Department of Energy dragged its feet. It waited until Obama was out of office. It waited until Senator Barbara Boxer was out of office to release its draft EIS in January 2017. The health stories that you'll be hearing from people today are not just anecdotal, they are supported by epidemiological studies. So it is critical that the city continue its strong support and assist the city attorney. Uh, you've already, the full council has already approved this measure and we hope that you will continue to do the same. I wanna repeat again that the Department of Energy um, has been a very bad player and we cannot let the Trump administration leave most of that contamination on site. There has been a lot of disinformation and misinformation about the cleanup. Uh, some of that's been um, put forward by people with ties to the Department of Energy. I urge you to continue your strong support. The community needs it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Melissa Bumstead, followed by Luke Bumstead, followed by Grace Bumstead. Hi, my name is Melissa Bumstead. First, I'd like to thank Council Members Wesson and Smith for introducing, oh, thank you so much, for introducing this motion. Um, I'm the mom who started the Change.org petition that now has over 600,000 signatures asking for the complete cleanup of the Santa Susana Field Lab. Um, I got involved after my daughter was diagnosed with cancer. It is important to me that the City of Los Angeles hire outside counsel to defend the cleanup. Um, my daughter's treatment has so far cost between two and three million dollars. And by our own self-reported data, we found more than 54 children within 10 to 15 miles of the site who have absurdly rare cancers. Um, so the fact that $600,000 is being discussed right now that for, to, to protect all the children in Los Angeles, that equals about three cents a child. So they never have to suffer autoimmune diseases, thyroid disorders, and even cancer. So I'd ask you, please vote yes on measure 190145. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Luke, welcome. I really don't, I really don't like the system there lab because I'm, it might have given my sister cancer. Lots of people died from cancer that I know. And that's what I don't like about it. So please clean up 
versus our lab. Say yes to get lawyers. Thank you. Grace, welcome. I am a two-time cancer survivor. I feel that Santa Susana Field Lab should be cleaned up now because it may have given me cancer and cancer is a bad, gave me bad memories. I think you should hire lawyers to get the cleanup. It has turned my life upside down and I think it's turned other kids' lives upside down too. I realize that cancer is never a good thing. I never feel safe living so near. I want to feel safe and it is possible to have the cleanup. Um, and it's po I want to help as much as I can, so please, I want to help as much as I can, so please clean, um, please, please vote on 190145. I think everyone's life will be better when it gets cleaned up. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, you guys. Great job. Thank you. And again, to Luke and Grace, sorry about what you had to listen to earlier. So, um, so our next speaker will be Jimmy Hara, followed by Richard Matthews, followed by Ruth Luevanos. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Fire Commissioner Jimmy Hara, but I'm here representing Physicians for Social Responsibility. You already heard from uh, Denise Stuffield talking about our involvement in the Santa Susana cleanup for decades now. And a decade ago, it was promised that a cleanup would have occurred. In the meantime, we have strontium-90, we have cesium-137 still in the groundwater, and you've already seen, witness, uh, the issue of childhood leukemias, childhood cancers, especially central nervous system cancers. And my plea to you is act upon what uh, was already agreed upon in terms of a cleanup that now uh, our president is wanting to uh, do away with. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, our next speaker is Richard Matthews, followed by Ruth Luevanos, followed by William Preston Bowling. Hi, Richard Matthews, Chatsworth. I'm president of North Valley Democratic Club and a board member of the California Democratic Party. And I want you to know on behalf of those organizations that they support, and in fact, every democratic organization around the field lab supports a full cleanup to background levels. This city council has voted unanimously in the past to support such a cleanup. But this isn't only a democratic issue. The all-Republican Simi Valley City Council voted unanimously the same way, and the same with the Ventura County Supervisors. This cleanup is morally due to the people of Los Angeles who have been damaged by this facility, and it is legally due to them to have these contracts upheld. The city represents those who are damaged and has the standing for this suit. Please fully fund a suit to make city residents whole and commit to win. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Ruth Luevanos, followed by William Preston Bowling. And then, as of now, that's the last speaker that I have on this item. Uh, is there anybody else who wanted to speak on this item? Okay, great. Hello, my name is Ruth Luevanos. I am a Simi Valley City Council member. I'm the only Democrat. Um, I know you said all Republican, but there's one of me. Um, I'm here as a cancer survivor myself. I had children who went to school in Canoga Park, Chatsworth West Hills. Now I'm a teacher in Reseda, where I have many of my students who are also fighting cancer and thyroid diseases directly related to the lack of cleanup at the Santa Susana Field Lab. So I'm a teacher in LA Unified. My students are directly impacted. I'm a daughter whose parents live in LA City, and my family and relatives all live in LA City. Um, I'm also a mother who wants to make sure that my children don't suffer through the same things that all of the other uh, parents with children who have cancer that have had to go through. And they talked about following the money. Absolutely. The, uh, the DOE has said time and time again that they want to uh, not have full cleanup because they want unrestricted use, which means they want to develop that area. That is wrong. That is immoral. And I implore you to please, please fund this lawsuit. Thank you. 
thank you very much. And then our final speaker on this matter will be uh, William Preston Bowling. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I uh, urge you to uh, vote in favor for item 9 and allocate the $600,000 for outside counsel to um, help ensure a proper cleanup of the Santa Susana Field Lab. And I want to remind everyone, this is the headwaters of the Los Angeles River. So whatever is up there has the uh, potential to migrate off-site, especially with all the natural disasters that we've had. The Woolsey Fire actually started at the Santa Susana Field Lab. So with all that vegetation gone, it has the potential for uh, off-site transport of these radionuclides and chemicals. Um, and it is the headwaters of the LA River. So we could have radioactive tritium or perchlorates or anything that are going down into the LA River. And with all the money that it's being spent to revitalize the LA River, I think that you should clean up the top so it doesn't impact the city of Los Angeles below. Thank you. OK. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I appreciate your offering your uh, comments on this matter. And with that, we are now prepared to go into closed session. So um, we will move to that room. We'll be a, a bit because we've got about, well, we've got nine items to, to discuss in closed session. But we'll be back. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, everyone, for your patience. Uh, we are now uh, back in open session. And before we proceed, I'd like to ask Mr. Choi to read in the um, committee's actions with regard to item number four and item number nine. Um, item number four, council file 190264, uh, it's the committee's disposition to receive and file the transmittal from the city attorney's office. And item, nine, item number nine, item, uh, council file 190145, it is the committee's disposition to instruct the CAO with the assistance of the city attorney to report on source of funds for this action, including but not limited to the use of outside council funds. And to advance those recommendations forward to council. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, members, item 12, uh, I had proposed for consent approval of the CAO's recommendations. And we've exhausted public comment on that matter. If, you, if there are no objections, it will be the action of the committee to approve the CAO's recommendations on item 12. Uh, so that will bring us next to oh, OK. I'm sorry, there's a, apparently a technical amendment on number 12. Oh. Yes, sir, there's a technical amendment by number 12. Um, the, amendment, uh, the amendment is as follows. Uh, move item KK from the report attachment 2 to attachment 1 and replace the following account instructions in order to transfer funds directly into the appropriated fund 100 account. Um, additionally, um, the, uh, an additional amendment is to revise the report recommendation number 1 and 2 to reflect the adjusted transfer balances for the respective reports in the attachment. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so if that wasn't clear, for those of you who came earlier and spoke on item number nine, we are approving the matter, moving it forward to council, um, just with a report back on the source of funding. So if you're here on that matter, that was the action that we took in committee. Or, excuse me, closed session. That will bring up uh, next item number 10. Item number 10 is a City Administrative Officer and Bureau of Street Services reports relative to near-term staffing plan for the sidewalk uh, vending program, economic development and public works and gain reduction, and the personnel and animal welfare committees waive consideration of this matter. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm David Hirano with the Office of the CAO. Before you have a report from our office um, recommending 24 resolution authorities for the Bureau of Street Services. Um, and providing funding from the Engineering Special Services Funds for two of those positions and funding for signage for no vending zones for the Department of General Services. 22 of the 24 resolution authorities are recommended solely for the purpose of beginning the hiring process. And should you approve them, the Bureau of Street Services would begin the hiring process but not put anybody on payroll until July 1st of 2019. What that does is allows them to get a jump start on the, the lengthy hiring process, but it also allows you and the mayor to decide what level of funding you want to approve for um, the budget for 2019-20 before bringing anybody on payroll. So um, with that, I think the recommendations before you are just for 
funding for 2018-19 only. So even though the RAs are unfunded positions, uh, we usually don't, I mean, RAs go year to year. Correct. So this would be for 18-19 unfunded, but we're not going to hire anybody into those positions prior to July 1st anyway, right? Well, what they're needed so that the personnel department and the Bureau of Street Services can begin that hiring process and they can select, uh, go through the selection process and start vetting candidates for these positions. Um, as we move through the budget process, um, the mayor's office and, and your committee will determine what level of funding will be actually provided for 1920, and that will inform their decisions as to actually how many people they will bring on uh, in July. Okay. So at this point, has there, are there any, uh, w what indicators do we have for the workload um, that would be, that would justify 22 positions? Well, I'll let um, the chief from Street Services answer that. Good afternoon, Gary Harris, Bureau of Street Services. Um, based on the activity that we're seeing right now, we actually believe that the 22 positions are the bare minimum uh, that we need to try to provide service throughout the city. It is our feeling that we actually need more personnel than these 22 positions, but in order to control the cost of these positions and to work in accord with the forthcoming permitting program, uh, hopefully to recover some of these costs. We've settled on this number of the overall 24 employees to provide coverage citywide. And uh, recently we've had an uptick in the number of complaints we receive related to vending. We've also noticed just out of the field that the vending has increased by as much as 50% that we're seeing citywide. So definitely the, the, the workload indicators are there showing that this level of service would be a minimum. Councilman, um, just so you know, we worked with the Bureau of Street Services to try and develop this lo level of staffing. Um, they initially had asked for a lot more, but what we view this as kind of a, a beginning in the program. And right now there are several no vending zones that the city has designated, and there are several hot spots where their vendors tend to congregate. Um, and we believe that with the 22 or actually 24 staff before you that this would be a, a reasonable complement to start with just to police the no vending zones and to hit some of the hot spots. And of course we would always hope that they'd be able to do more than that, but this is kind of our assessment on a city this big and what they would need. Now, they've told us that they would have two overlapping shifts of 10 hours apiece to try and co um, cover all the hours that vending would occur, and that would be seven days a week. Mm -hmm. um, I personally think that's quite a challenge that the chief has before him, but um, that was the basis from which we made our recommendation. Okay. So, but just to be clear, these are approvals in this budget year. There will be no hiring prior to the next fiscal year. And so if we approve 22 resolution authorities today in next year's budget, we could decide that that number should be 40 positions or five positions. And whatever we decide in that budget, that's the number of positions that will be filled. Um, with one minor, one minor um, correction there, the, of the 24, the chief um, street services investigator and the management analysts will be filled this year, and they are needed to help sure. continue to develop the permit system. Um, the other 22 are the ones that um, we would still need a policy decision from you and the mayor's office right. to, to fill. Yep, but, but my point being with that, right. that if, if a different decision is made in the budget that we're about to yes. begin consideration of, those unfunded positions, RAs, would just either go away or be expanded. They, there's Correct. Starting the process, starting the hiring process does not commit us to a particular course of action in the next budget, I guess. Correct. Okay, very good. Mr. Price. Yeah, I uh, certainly support the, the recommendation. I know that the, there is a desire to have more, as was suggested, and this is a compromise coming down, but I think enforcement is, in, is important. Education is important. I think the, the fact that uh, we've seen an uptick in vending, people think it's legal now, <laughs> you know, so without kind of going through with the... Uh, 
the, uh, the whole uh, information and education process. So I, I think it's important that we have uh, folks on the street uh, to uh, help enforce the law and inform folks what the law is. Uh, as the chair stated, this is a start. Uh, we still uh, have, we'll have to make a determination of how we move forward, but I think this is an important way to get started. Mr. Chairman, I would support it. Thank you. Mr. Bonnet, on this one? Mm, no. Okay. We have some members of the public, so if you want to come back afterwards, that's fine. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of speakers on this matter, so I'd like to invite up Faustino Martinez, Caridad Vasquez, and Santa Huerta, please. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, sounds good. Hello? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Mr. Martinez? Muy buenas tardes, señores miembros de este comité. Good afternoon to all the members of the committee. Mi nombre es Faustino Martinez y soy vendedor ambulante. My name is Faustino Martinez and I am a street vendor. A nombre de todos mis compañeros, estamos agradecidos con la ciudad. On behalf of all my members from the campaign, we are pleased with the city. Por crear un programa legal de la venta ambulante. For creating a legal program for street vendors. Porque existe la gran necesidad de hacer nuestro trabajo digno, honrado y estar en paz. Because there is a huge need for us to be able to do our work um, with dignity and with peace. Si la ciudad aprueba los, los fondos para el programa de la venta ambulante. If the city approves the funds um, for more funding for the street vending program. Me gustaría ver más actividades y prácticas donde los inspectores organicen clases. We would like to see uh, more programming and activities where inspectors hold classes um, to talk about the rules and regulations for street vendors. Donde ellos nos enseñen a los vendedores a qué hacer y qué no hacer. And to be able to inform us on the things that we could do and we can't do. Primero que nos enseñen para nos enseñen las reglas y no solo lleguen para darnos tickets. Um, in order for us, for them to be able to give us um, more rules and regulations and information on this instead of giving us tickets. Okay. Muchísimas gracias, nos, señor. Ya se terminó. Pido, pido extensión porque por la interpretación. Gracias. Estoy el um, he asked for more time because of the interpretation. Okay. okay. Gracias. gracias. Okay. Thank okay. you. Caridad Vázquez. Buenas tardes, como lo acaba de decir el compañero, mi nombre es Caridad Vázquez y soy líder de Guayo Heights. Pues, um, good afternoon everyone, my name is Cari, um, and I am also a street vendor leader, um, but in Boyle Heights. Pues, como vendedora, yo quiero pedirles que nos ayuden a que nos, nos, a, a introducir cómo podemos vender en un futuro. Um, I want to request, um, for there to be more classes on how to, um, better do the rules and regulations on how we're supposed to conduct hay that regla, practice. Hay reglas, pero a veces nosotros los vendedores no entendemos. There's one regulations, but sometimes we are not informed and we don't understand. Y nos dan un papel que cómo podemos capacitarnos, pero no entendemos. And they give us a paper on the rules and regulations, but we don't understand that. Y yo les pido que hagan más personal para que ellos nos, nos digan vendedor por vendedor qué podemos hacer para poder trabajar. So we request for there to be more personnel in this um, program for them to be able to come to us um, in, our, in our stands and be able to tell us what we could do and, we, and what we can't do. El 22 de este mes nos dieron mucha información. On the 22nd they had um, a big workshop on what we could do and what we can't do and to inform us. Pero mucho vendedor no entendió cómo vamos a trabajar. Um, but a lot of the vendors needed more um, access on information because we didn't fully understand. Queremos más información. 
para trabajar y educarnos cómo ustedes quieren que trabajemos en un futuro. Uh, we are requesting more um, programs for us to be able to know what we could and what we can't do. Y gracias por el apoyo que nos están dando. And thank you so much for all the help you guys have been giving us so far. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Uh, our next our next speaker is Santa Huerta, followed by Rosa Miranda, followed by Michelle Benavides. Uh, buenas tardes a todos miembros presentes. Mi nombre es Santa Huerta. Yo soy vendedora ambulante también. Uh, Estoy en represent representando a todos mis compañeros ambulantes. Y Sorry. Um, good afternoon, every um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Santa, and I am a street vendor. Estoy representando a mis compañeros ambulantes. I am re representing my street vendor partners. Como dijo mi compañera, el día 22 de marzo tuvimos un, um, un seminario de 250 um, ambulantes. Like my colleague said, on, on this, this past month, on the 22nd, we had a big convening um, for street vendors. Con todo el fondo, si ustedes lo permiten, con lo que se va a crear ese fondo, a mí y a mis compañeros nos gustaría que formen talleres y programas donde nos puedan educar. Um, so we are requesting if um, the funding is approved to have more classes on um, to educate us on the new rules and regulations for street vendors. Infinitamente gracias por todo. Esperamos trabajar juntos con las reglas que ustedes nos van a dar. Vamos a trabajar mancomunadamente con ustedes. Muchísimas gracias. Esperamos. Um, thank you so much again for all the support you have given us, and we look forward to partnering up with you guys and be able to um, find a solution that works for both of us. Gracias. Uh, our next speaker is Rosa Miranda, followed by Michelle Benavides, followed by Sherry Franklin, followed by Jasmine Aguiar. Good afternoon. Uh, buenas tardes, miembros de este comité. Good afternoon to members of this committee. Uh, mi nombre es Rosa Miranda. Soy organizadora con ICLA Community Corporation. My name is Rosa uh, Miranda, and I am a community organizer with ICLA Community Corporation. Um, a mí me toca el trabajo de comunicarme con los vendedores ambulantes. Uh, my job is to work together with um, the street vendors. Y apreciamos el trabajo que estamos haciendo con el uh, Buró de Calles y Aceras. And we're, great, uh, we're greatly grateful for um, the support and partnership we are doing with uh, Bureau of Street Services and the city. El pasado viernes 22 de marzo tuvimos una cumbre donde hubo más de 250 vendedores. Um, this past um, event on the 22nd, we had a huge success with over 300 vendors that showed up to our convening. Y um, este es el primero, pero no queremos que sea el último. And this is the first convening, but we hope not to be the last. Uh, y lo que queremos es que ustedes puedan proteger dinero, fondos, para que sigamos trabajando con el buró. And uh, we turn it to you to be able to support us, to be um, able to have more funds for this program, so we could uh, work closely with Bill Street Services. Necesitamos que los inspectores trabajen a uh, los fines de semana donde están los vendedores ambulantes. Um, in order to create um, funds to have more inspectors to be able to go on the weekends and reach out to the vendors because those are the days that they mostly work. También a uh, muchos de nuestros miembros no saben leer y uh, la manera de aprender es visual. Queremos que pongan más visuales, que muestren más la, las reglas de, de la ley. Um, and just to end on that, most of our street vendors, or some of them don't, um, don't know how to read and write, so they're more of a visual learner, and those are the different workshops that we need to be able to implement in. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, our next speaker is... So, I'm Michelle. Oh, okay. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle, and I am an, I am also an organizer with East LA Community Corporation and the Los Angeles Street Vendor Campaign. We are very happy to be working with the Bureau of Street Services and supporting vendors understand the new rules and regulations. In the past few months, our team has accompanied BSS um, officers on the streets to meet with vendors and encourage dialogue. 
This type of work and practice has helped build trust and vendors want to comply with these rules. We greatly su support the funding for this, but we want to stress the need for outreach and education. This program needs staff that can create curriculum and educational content on just and not just enforcement agents. We would we will be more than happy to work with the city and BSS on developing outreach and educational plans and other tools to ensure this program success. Um, and thank you again for your hard work and partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sherry Franklin, followed by Jasmine Aguiar. Hi, Sheree Franklin, uh, Urban Design Center. We are the uh, managers for the Central Avenue Historic District. Also, we're the consultants for the Lamert Park Village Crenshaw Corridor Business Improvement District. And I would like to say that it, you've he heard lots of testimony from the bids. Uh, we would want uh, to work in partnership with staff to look at how uh, bending is implemented on the corridors, particularly on Central Avenue, which is very important to, to me. Uh, we can work to um, coordinate efforts with the existing property owners who are struggling, who have to pay taxes and all those things, and we can welcome them through organized opportunities, um, but we need the city to acknowledge that the bids are putting in lots of time and energy into this process, and we want to be at the table. Secondly, we think that the opportunity should be broadened. There are lots of other uh, people who are interested. We're actually paying for our businesses to have street vending as well on Central Avenue, particularly on the corner of 43rd and Central. And that we think that's a solution also to offer businesses an opportunity to do vending, which is uh, something they've been doing over time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is Jasmine Aguiar here? Hasmin? Nope. Okay. All right. Uh, that concludes our speakers on this item. Was there anybody else that wanted to speak on this item? It's not on my list. Okay. Uh, very good. Um, Okay, so uh, any other discussion on this matter, members? Mr. Price, anything else? Okay, so uh, I'm going to recommend that we approve the CAO's recommendations uh, and additional recommendations by the Public Works Gang Reduction Committee uh, during consideration of the Bureau of Street Services report on February 20th, 2019, um, and inst A, instruct the Bureau of Street Services to report on the de deployment of additional officers with regard to the sidewalk vending program and the impact sidewalk vending enforcement has had on the investigation and enforcement division. And two, with an update on short-term pilot programs, including the location selection process. And also to request the city attorney to report with an update on the expungement program, including a timeline for implementation. Mm -hmm. So if there's no objection. No objection. That will be the action of the committee. Thank you very much. Uh, that will bring up item number 11. Item number 11 is a joint Public Works Bureau of Engineering, Los Angeles uh, Department of Transportation, Public Works Bureau of Street Services report relative to the budget for Reseda Boulevard Street Reconstruction Vision Zero program. Uh, the Public Works and Gang Reduction Committee approved the matter on February 20, 2019 and the Transportation Committee approved the matter as amended on February 27, 2019. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Gene Edwards, Bureau of Engineering. Daniel Samaro, LADOT. John Saponi, Bureau of Street Services, Street LA. I'll start off with a short introduction. Um, as was instructed by council, we are reporting back because estimated costs on the updated scope for the Reseda Boulevard Complete Streets project will exceed the $17.3 million project limit that was set by council in March of 2018. The report, uh, the, the joint report contains a detailed breakdown of costs for two alternatives. Uh, alternative number one is for the full scope costing $24.7 million. And there's an alternative number two, which is a modified scope costing $21.4 million. The alternative one scope is $3.3 million more than the alternative two scope. And it is $7.4 million more than the last adopted budget for the Reseda project. Alternative one includes items that is considered to be core reconstruction or Vision Zero elements. And it also includes other items that are not necessarily core items 
These other elements include um, two new street transit shelters and associated nighttime lighting, uh, seven relocated transit shelters and associated nighttime lighting, planting of trees in 112 empty tree wells, planting of trees in 47 new tree wells, and aesthetic treatments within the public way. Examples of such treatments include stamped concrete treatments, colored concrete treatments, pavement artwork at crosswalks, drywall cover beautification, pedestrian wayfinding signage, place-based signage, pole wrapping beautification, traffic control box beautification, bike racks, and public furniture. As stated in the joint report by BOE, Street Services, and LADOT, the preferred alternative being recommended is alternative one for the full complete street scope. The final full scope was derived after conducting detailed engineering and transportation analysis and expanded outreach that includes consideration of feedback from public, public and business engagement. I'm going to turn it over to DOT now. Sure. So I'm here to talk about uh, engagement and the Vision Zero elements that you would see as part of Reseda. So um, our project team, we worked um, diligently with the council offices and with community leaders uh, to have a very robust engagement approach along the corridor. Um, and part of our efforts were to um, actually engage each individual business along the corridor, um, conducted a, a, a study and a survey to make sure that they understood the project and understood the, the benefits and the trade-offs. That was really important for us to do. Um, we also held um, a council office open house in CD3, um, held neighborhood council meetings, had a, a public comment audit, um, and canvassed and tabled at, at many uh, street fairs in the area to really inform people about the project. And we've also met and worked with Metro and with um, Access Paratransit to make sure that uh, those that be affected by the street operation were, were fully bought in to what we were trying to do. Um, so going into the Vision Zero elements, um, I'm referring back to, I believe it's Council File 17-0950. Uh, um, and this is um, Council Action Item Number 7, which directed the city engineer to include the design of curb extensions um, for the Reseda Boulevard project and then report back on the cost. So from our engineering team, we, we looked at different street alternatives and wanted to value engineer and come up with the best alternative for the cost. We looked at traditional curb extensions and we also looked at bo bus boarding islands and we found that there was um, a significant cost savings as well as um, transit efficiency improvements and, and safeties for other street users. Um, going with a protected bike lane configuration with these bus boarding islands. So, so we, we made some refinements to try to really cut cost and, and improve the operation of the street. Um, in addition to that, you'll um, find um, eight new protected left turn phasing improvements along the corridor. Um, striping improvements, again, this is a street that's on the mobility plan designated um, as a bike enhanced network. Um, and we've got um, concrete bus boarding islands, which again, provide a lot of the benefits of curb extensions, but don't affect uh, modifying um, drainage in the street to really help save cost, but also provide concrete protection for, for the road users. Um, and also included um, pedestrian islands. So again, just allow pedestrians to have refuge. And again, these are concrete elements that aren't touching the curb, the existing curb. They're, they're offset from the curb so that we don't have additional costs for re-engineering, you know, storm drainage and those sorts of things. So we really try to be um, effective in providing, providing safety improvements, but being conscious of, of budget and um, provide an al alternative that is um, easier to design and, and but gives a lot of benefit to the road users. So with BSS, we uh, met with uh, GSD, I'm sorry, with uh, BOE and uh, coordinate with some strategies to keep costs low on the reconstruction matter and provided some different pavement preservation techniques for them to uh, reevaluate uh, their, uh, their estimates. Right. Okay. An example, example of that would be the, um, the reconstruction portion of the, uh, of the pavement, um, where in the full scope, there's approximately a million square feet of um, um, repaving, uh, which will be done in a, um, in a uh, designed, an engineering design section that, that will restore the strength of the, the pavement section 
uh, for a life of, we're designing for a life of 10 to 20 years. An example of the efficiency there is that um, we've increased our, our coverage of, from 19.3 uh, lane miles to 16 lane miles, which is a 72% increase in the, in the treated surface area, and the cost of the reconstruction uh, portion of the budget is only increased 5%. Okay. Um, well, thank you uh, for coming back and with this further report. Um, this, I'm confident, will, if, if it is completed to this degree, will be an exceptional, mm -hmm. beautiful project, very impactful project. Um, that being said, uh, there is not $7 million in the budget, in the general fund, to pay for an over-budget project. And we, there just isn't. There's not $10 in the budget for an over-budget project. Um, the, this project was, was to have been specially funded with SB1 and other source fundings. Um, we only have, I think, six of these going on right now. So that extra $7 million that we would pay out of the general fund to put it into a context, we're spending about a little over $30 million a year on sidewalk repair throughout the entire city of Los Angeles. Um, so uh, I, I just, I can't sign off on continuing to fund these programs with general fund money unless we have an assessment that this is the most effective Vision Zero use of the money that there is. And aesthetic improvements and tree planting and other things just aren't because they aren't life-saving measures. And we have people dying in the streets still. Um, and to spend money on enhancements like this, I, I just, I, I can't justify it to myself. So um, until we can de make a determination that it's better to spend seven million more, seven million general fund dollars on Reseda Boulevard than it is to pay for more traffic enforcement officers or repairs to sidewalks or repairs to potholes and bike lanes or the other things that are killing people uh, throughout the city. I just, I can't support this. So, but I don't want to give up on it either. So my suggestion, and I'm open to hearing from my, what my colleagues think, but my suggestion would be, I'd like to get another report back on what non-general fund sources can we utilize to enhance this project and to meet its, its needs um, without impacting the general fund. But I'd also like to know whatever the recommended source of funding for any additional funding required by this project is, um, I'd like to get a report to this committee, and I, I suspect T committee will want to hear this as well, what are the other projects that will need to be displaced because of that funding? If we're taking money from another special fund, for example, what are we not paying for uh, in those special funds in order to pay for these? Um, so, I don't know, Mr. Bonin, do you have some thoughts before we... I was going to say something, and then you said exactly what I was going to propose. I love it when that happens. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, we're going to go ahead and hold this one in committee for now until we get that further report back about specific funding s sources. Ideally, non-general fund sources, because I'll be a tough sell on general fund support. Yeah, um, so, Mr. Price, anything? I concur. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, then without objection, we'll go ahead and hold this one in committee and request that ad those additional reports back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, that brings us then to item number. We took 12 already. Item 13. Item number 13 is a joint chief legislative analyst and city administrative officer reports relative to enforcement against illegal commercial cannabis activity and budget policy to provide ongoing and sustained funding for Department of Cannabis Regulation Programming, Illegal Enforcement Operations, and Child and Youth Development, Prevention, and Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Education. The Rules, Elections, and Intergovernmental Relations Committee approved the matter as, approved, as amended on November 16, 2018. All right. Uh, so who do we have to report on item 13? <clears throat> then we got the cannabis. Oh, there she is. Okay.
Sorry, Ms. Packard, didn't see you back there. Come on up. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for your patience. Ms. Packer, go right ahead. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. Uh, before you, we have uh, two reports that are about five months old, uh, considering both a cannabis budget policy that the city could adopt and a number of uh, enforcement-related items. Uh, there is one report, uh, the November 15th report, which is entitled the Cannabis Budget Policy, and a, another report, a November 9th report, this is again a joint report from the CAO and CLA's office related to illegal cannabis enforcement. Uh, part of what we'd like to be able to discuss this afternoon is funding specifically for our social equity program, uh, and specifically funding to uh, allow us to administer the business licensing and compliance assistance that is required by uh, Los Angeles Municipal Code 104.20. This is essentially the uh, part of the section that creates the social equity program itself. Uh, back in 2017, when the City of Los Angeles first passed its cannabis ordinances, it established a social equity program which required the department by law to provide priority processing, business licensing and compliance assistance to applicants, and also a fee deferral program if established. Since 2017, there have been a number of developments, uh, fortunately, for the department. We have been working to scale our operations, to move through uh, the various phases of licensing. Uh, but we are now at a point uh, where we need general fund resources and able to move forward to provide the technical assistance that is required by the ordinance. <coughs> Uh, without this business licensing and compliance assistance funded by the general fund, the department is unable to comply with laws established by this council. We are also able to, we are also unable to receive and process additional licenses. Uh, and part of the reason is, is that the ordinance itself specifies the order in which we're to process certain applications. And right now, uh, com rules committee is considering uh, essentially preventing additional licensure until technical assistance is required uh, and allocated by the department. Uh, we are asking today that the Budget and Finance Committee adopt Rules Recommendation 3 to adopt a cannabis budget policy whereby the department would receive $3 million on an annual basis for three years to fund the social equity program. Uh, we would like to clarify, though, that the budget policy that we're asking this count this committee to adopt is specifically for the business licensing and compliance assistance that the ordinance requires. Uh, it's important for us to make this distinction because the social equity program itself has a number of different components. Priority processing, this business licensing and compliance assistance, the fee deferral program that's been established by council, uh, and essentially the report that was created both by the CLA uh, and CAO's office uh, may conflate the, the two, uh, and I'd like to make a distinction before this body uh, that essentially we are asking for uh, a budget policy specifically for the business licensing and compliance assistance. I, it, it may not be a conf conflation. I, uh, it may be my interpretation and reading of uh, the budget policy itself, but it should just be noted that in the report itself, uh, it identifies that we're seeking this funding for business licensing and compliance assistance. It does make note of additional funding for our fee deferral program. Uh, so it, it recognizes that we're essentially asking money for one program, not the other. Uh, there's also a distinction and nuance that may need to be made uh, to this committee as well. Uh, through the regular budget process, the department is seeking funding, general funding, general fund funding, not only to fund the uh, technical assistance required by the social equity program, but we're also seeking general fund dollars to fund a public information campaign. Uh, and I want to make sure that in this report and in your consideration of this report, uh, you, you understand that we're asking for two separate allocations of funding. Uh, one funding uh, general fund allocation for our public information campaign and a separate general fund allocation 
for the business licensing and compliance assistance. Uh, we are uh, seeking this committee to adopt a recommendation, again, from Rules Committee, allocating $3 million per year pro to provide the technical assistance. The reason why we're asking for this money to be adopted for a term of three years is that the social equity program specifically uh, imagines a term of three years. We actually ask our businesses, require our businesses to sign a social equity agreement. The term of the agreement is for three years. And so the licensing portion of the social equity program does have a duration uh, in mind. Essentially, it's the opportunity to provide technical assistance to these businesses as they're getting up and running. Uh, so again, our intention is to try uh, to ask this committee uh, to fund our cannabis budget policy specifically for business licensing and compliance assistance uh, with general fund dollars uh, and that there be a distinction made between monies received uh, and allocated for the business licensing and compliance assistance and the public information campaign. Uh, this report is largely, uh, and our response to this report is largely focused on the cannabis budget policy. There may be other stakeholders in the room who would like an opportunity to report back specifically on the November really 15th report uh, on illegal cannabis enforcement. Okay. Um, before we do that, though, so from in looking at the Rules, Elections, and uh, IG Relations Committee report, Recommendation number five, requesting the city attorney to prepare the ordinance whereby the DCR would receive $3 million annually to fund the social equity program. You would, to uh, be faithful to the nuance that you've, you've raised, we should probably change that language to the business licensing and compliance program. Correct. Okay. So does that encompass, does that anticipate waived fees and uh, uh, business tax obligations, uh, or is that affirmative expenditures of m money for the technical assistance and educational part? It does not uh, capture fee deferrals or fee waivers that would be granted to these folks. It is essentially affirmative programmatic support uh, to help these folks through the licensing process and to rem remain compliant. Okay. Now, um, the Rules Committee as far as I can see, doesn't have a specific request in it uh, for the public information appropriation that you're talking about. So Correct. where do I find that? I, I just wanted to make sure that we were uh, making the distinction because in conversations with the CAO's office, and I could see how a reading of this report uh, a reading of this report could be in interpreted to include our public information campaign. For example, uh, when, we, when we talk, this is at the top of page two for the Cannabis Budget Policy Report, uh, it discusses, it says, DCR would provide technical and business assistance for the social equity program participants as well as workforce development and outreach. Uh, I just want to make sure that this committee is not assuming that that outreach that is named here is the public information campaign, which we, are which we are intending to do citywide to let consumers and members of the general public know what is legal, essentially sharing health and safety information with members of the general public. Uh, this specific outreach that is named in here is relative to the business licensing and compliance assistance of the social equity program. Okay. So we're, we're not acting on an appropriation with regard to the, the other Correct. The educational center. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Mr. Bonin, anything for Ms. Packer? Because we're also on the enforcement. Uh, we'll also bring up LAPD and city attorney, I think, to talk about enforcement. Um, so do you want to... Uh, just a, a, a couple questions, because I, I just want to be clear. I, I think you are... Uh, in, in addition to the ask before us today, I think you are wisely using this opportunity to educate us and pre-ask us for the overall budget hearings that are coming up. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't meant to be an applause line, but... <laughs> it just comes naturally for you, Mr. Yeah, I guess. Um, no, I was just saying that, that I thought a lot of what she's saying is probably trying to prep us for the conversations to come during our annual budget process. Um, so folks aren't confused about why we're not doing some of the, 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 the stuff you're talking about today. And maybe you should articulate that a little bit too. Yeah, I mean, what we, what we do is uh, th th uh, in April and May, 
this body, the, the three of us and two of our other colleagues are going to spend about a month downstairs in day-long hearings discussing next year's budget. And we go department by department. And there will be some very specific requests supplemental to what is being discussed here today. Because uh, our fiscal year starts July, July 1st. So we're just about to get into the process of deciding our budget for next year. This is the very last few months of this budget year. Yep. So uh, thank you for, for, for that. I just wanted to get a little clarity on what you were just saying. So I, I heard three things, but I only heard two sort of uh, uh, funding requests. I heard that there's the uh, business license and compliance, which is what we're discussing today. Uh, I heard that there's the public information campaign citywide, which I presume is going to be part of the, the discussion for the next fiscal year's budget. Correct. And then there's the question of the fee deferral. Um, uh, is, is that already anticipated in your budget, or is that something that is, 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 a, is a budget hole that needs to be filled? And if it needs to be filled, does it need to be filled for the last couple months of this fiscal year to get us <clears throat> moving, or does it need to be filled in the next fiscal year? I'm going to uh, ask my assistant executive director, Jason Colleen, to explain the uh, request that we made previously relative to the fee deferral program uh, and how we're approaching that as we moved into the formal city's budget process in our request. Good afternoon, committee. Uh, Jason Colleen, assistant executive director, Department of Cannabis Regulation. Um, so we had made an original request for $2 million for fee deferrals, um, and we were approved for 250000 um, what that's going to allow us to do is accommodate the fee deferral requests that were included as part of phase two. Um, so initially that 250 will cover 31 different license activities. Um, and then basically folks that are accepted into the fee deferral program will have one year to repay those fees. And they'll pay a quarter of the fee due every quarter. And as we get those payments back, that's going to allow us to accept additional people into the fee deferral program. Ultimately, the 250 will allow us to accommodate 124 different fee deferral activities within the scope of the three-year period. Um, if the council believes that this program is successful and would like to expand the amount of money that could be utilized for that purpose, they would definitely have the opportunity to do that. Um, but at this time, we do have 250000 um, It will allow us to consider the fee deferral request that came in as part of phase two. Um, we did have less than 30. And then kind of as phase three launches and new businesses come in and ask for that assistance, we should have the cash flow to bring additional um, fee deferrals into the program. And, and just to give you uh, the kind of short and, and quick version, we, we asked originally for $2 million to be allocated out of the UB. Uh, at the time that we requested uh, those funds to be allocated, uh, money may have not been received in the UB to actually be allocated. And so uh, instead of the $2 million that we originally requested, uh, we were allocated 250k for the uh, fee deferral program. So I imagine that as we head into the regular budget process, we are going to be asking actively for funding for the fee deferral program and for the business licensing and compliance assistance. So for the fee deferral, given the number, it sounds like what Jason said, given the number of requests you have right now and what it sounds like you will have the opportunity to, to work on a process between now and the, the, the last 90 days of, of this fiscal year, right? Yeah, 90 days. Um, uh, the 250 is okay, you'll, but you will need the additional in the coming fiscal year. Correct. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. I have more questions, but I can wait till after the, the other part of the presentation. Very good. Mr. Price? Uh, again, I think that we have to provide the resources to make this program work, just like we're providing resources for street vending. I think it's important that we provide uh, the uh, money for the uh, business inclusion program, as you, as you articulated the, the distinction. Uh, I, I guess uh, the question is how much and how long, uh, but I think it's important that we begin funding this activity now uh, at the greatest level possible. So I'm anxious, anxious to hear the comments. <clears throat> All right. Um, before we uh, take comment from the public, we also have before us on this giant, uh, on this agenda item, uh, a report on uh, enforcement against illegal commercial cannabis activity. So um, we have LAPD representatives to report on that. Do we? 
Okay. Um, and anybody from city attorney who can report on that? Okay, come on up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So if you want to just give us kind of an overview of where we stand with enforcement and uh, what the ongoing needs will be, please. Absolutely. Uh, Vito, uh, CISHA, Gang and Narcotics Division. Uh, currently, uh, we are still utilizing traditional uh, enforcement techniques such as our search warrants. Uh, we begin uh, implementing the uh, utility disconnect ordinance. Um, as uh, well as started uh, sending out all of the uh, cease and desist letters uh, for the businesses to um, stop their operations. Uh, we have, we're currently we're at about 43 search warrants, uh, probably about 45 now. Uh, we've made about 107 arrests. This is, these are year-to-date stats. Uh, recovered 28 firearms, seized over $155,000 and uh, recovered almost 8,000 pounds of cannabis. As far as the season, season uh, I'm sorry, as far as the uh, utility disconnect, uh, due to the logistics involved and the different entities that uh, within our city partners that we have to deal with, uh, we're doing it bureau by bureau. Uh, the first bureau that we started with is Valley Bureau. Uh, we've had Valley, we're asking each bureau to identify locations that they'd like to employ the uh, utility disconnect and Valley Bureau identified uh, 34 locations. Uh, this was about uh, two weeks ago that we asked them to identify these locations. Currently, we've uh, disconnected utilities at 12 of those locations and anticipate uh, disconnecting uh, another 10 locations within the next couple of weeks. After that, I've already made contact with our South Bureau and asked them to submit about seven to 10 locations each. And at this point, we ten tentatively uh, hope to start in South Bureau uh, the middle or third week of April, and then we'll uh, start disconnecting uh, utilities at those locations. Great. Anything? Anything else to add? Uh, no, sir. That's it. So, um, the work, the enforcement working group has already been established with LAPD, LAFD, uh, DCR. No. Uh, um, we're, we're not. We're not there quite yet. Uh, okay. The. Uh, Department, LAPD, City Attorney's Office, a number of us have been meeting for months now to uh, discuss with the enforcement strategy, but it would be uh, untrue to say that the working group has formally uh, come together. Okay. Uh, we're still in communication uh, with the Mayor's Office about how that uh, group is actually to, to uh, get infrastructure. Uh, Great. So we do meet with our city partners on a regular basis. Uh, right now we are currently uh, uh, ha we do have a cooperative effort with DCR and DWP as far as these disconnections. Uh, we have met with uh, a representative from the fire department, uh, spoke to them regarding what ordinances they have on their side that uh, could help us at the search warrant locations or at the utility disconnect locations as far as if these individuals start uh, utilizing generators and things of that nature. All right. Well, there might be a recommendation to more formalized that that process so uh, thank you it, can you talk a little bit about because you, you mentioned that the cease and desist letters are already going out um, talk about the mechanics a little bit of that you know how many have gone out how do you identify the locations do they go to the business and to the landlord um, and it, have you had any circumstances where somebody has responded and said hey you know we're in compliance yeah, you're you're wrong about this we just received the authority to use them about a week ago. So they just started going out. Okay. So I haven't received any input about them as far as feedback from the individuals that they <clears> haven't <throat> been sent to. Um, the way we track it, we track our enforcement efforts not through specific enforcement efforts, but uh, for the cease and desist letters, the utility disconnect. All we do is, uh, my, at Gang and Narcotics Division, the, the Cannabis Support Unit basically uh, tracks all statistical information 
regarding what our uh, narcotics enforcement details do on a divisional level. So every two weeks we ask them, we submit a data capture sheet. Every two weeks we ask them to return it to us regarding the statistical information that we're asking for on those sheets, such as search warrants, uh, evidence recovered, money recovered, arrests, how many uh, 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 cease and desist letters, how many times have you utilized it, the uh, utility disconnect, and then we base our numbers off of that. Every quarter, we ask those uh, narcotics enforcement details to send us an updated list of unlicensed locations in their area. So based on the number that they send us each quarter is how we determine the, effect the effectiveness of our enforcement efforts. Okay. So just to be clear, are the cease and desist letters coming from LAPD or from DCR? From LAPD, the way we're doing it now, initially, uh, I'm advising all of the narcotics enforcement details. It's the narcotics enforcement details that are primarily responsible for, for all the enforcement efforts regarding uh, narcotics activity, including cannabis. Um, so it's not a centralized model. It's decentralized in that sense. Okay. So we're asking all the narcotics enforcement details to take those letters with them at the time of disconnect aside from sending those letters out and making every attempt to identify the owners of the properties. Okay. All right. So, Mr. President? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the report. So, uh, is, it a, is it a form letter or is it addressed to someone or it's just, you know, you, you stick it in the door when you're passing by? How, how does that work? Yes and no. So, if they take them to the location where the utilities are going to be disconnected and they're able to make contact with someone who identifies themselves as a manager or business owner, then it's addressed to them. If uh, through their investigation they are able to identify the property owner, then it's addressed to them or the management company. But we should always be able to identify the property owner, shouldn't we? I'm sorry, sir? I said we should always be able to identify the property owner. I, I would assume so, but again, that's, up to, that's the responsibility of our narcotics enforcement details. And we are advising them to do, make every effort to do that. Well, I just think it should be more coordinated. It just seems, <laughs> seems like it's... It seems like it's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I know we're ramping up, but I know that there are some challenges with doing that, uh, you know, but, but I just, I just, uh, I just got to be a little better coordination. I mean, I, I like the idea of, of, you know, giving our officers free will, but just to say, report back as you will, you know, it seems like it's kind of... Uh, we're not asking them to report back as they will. I mean, we are asking okay, them. Folks, to, well, come on. Let's, let's, thank we you. are asking them to report every two yeah, weeks as yeah. far as how, the, how their efforts are going and what they're doing. Okay. And do the cease and, do the, uh, cease and assist letters uh, uh, have anything to do with the cutoff? Do they, does it refer to it that you're going to be cut off? Is there any kind of reference to the cutoff, or is it just a separate activity? The cutoff of utilities? Yes. It's all incorporated within a letter as well as even a board up clause, saying that at this point the, the due process is starting for the board up if that ordinance gets passed. I think that would obviously be an ex extremely valuable effort for us if we were able to board up these locations. Okay, thank if you. If we were able to take the property away from, from the type of activity they're engaging in, mm -hmm. That would resolve the issue, I think, a lot better than with just a utility disconnect because we've already received reports that these individuals are just going out and buying generators. All right. Yeah. All right. And, and easy to identify because many of them have a green cross on the, on the doors, right? Well, they're getting a little smarter. Now they're, 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 they're doing a number of things. Well, let's start with the ones that have the, let's, let's start with the dumb ones that still have the green crosses out. Well, let's... <laughs> Council members, I mean, if, I, if I may. The advent of technology and, you know, certain online platforms and things like that that don't discriminate between legal and illegal, um, uh, you know, businesses. And, and we do use is, weed maps as an effective, yeah. resourceful tool yeah. to identify these locations. Sorry, Ms. Packer. Uh, no, I, I think that you uh, named some very obvious challenges that the city has in its enforcement strategy. Uh, throughout the course of the last 14 months, the department has been working hand in hand uh, with law enforcement to ascertain what tools the city has available for it to use in its enforcement strategy. We've identified that there are a number of agencies who do have effective tools that can be used. I think that historically uh, there wasn't a, a great sense of coordination between agencies, uh, and that is what we hope the enforcement task force is able to do. Uh, the department, and, and this is captured in, in what some of these recommendations are, uh, have recommended a uh, 
coordinated enforcement strategy where the city is using one centralized mechanism to receive complaints from members of the general public because right now uh, LAPD may create their own complaints. We have a complaint portal. City attorney has its own complaint portal. Building and safety has its own complaint portal. And so a lot of the times we're not even looking at the same data. Uh, but I do think that there are steps that can be taken, uh, one on the policy side to coordinate this effort, but because there are so many different agencies that are involved, there is going to need to be an upfront conversation about the resources necessary to effectuate uh, those outcomes. A centralized task force model would probably be, in my opinion, the most effective model for us to move forward with. With a centralized model, you don't have, it's the way it is now with 21 geographic divisions and 21 narcotics enforcement details, sometimes trying to disseminate and collect information is like wrangling cats. It's difficult. But with a centralized model, and when you have DCR, DWP, LAFD all under one roof, you don't have to go to uh, send emails or, or make phone calls to a number of different entities in order to get something accomplished. Uh, as for the perfect example is the utility disconnect and the cease and desist letters. If there were additional sworn uh, assigned to that task force, that is something that we would be able to handle on our own out of gang and narcotics division to where we would make a concerted effort to identify the property owners, uh, make sure that we hand deliver those, lo those letters to the business owners. Uh, made sure that uh, proper uh, statistics were being taken and tracked regarding the utility disconnect and how effective it is, how effective the letters are. But when you're asking a number of different entities within a department, it becomes a little more difficult. Thank you. Mr. Bond. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the, the reports. Um, uh, I agree we need to get the, the task force up and running. I think it should be formalized. Um, uh, I think, in, in speaking with Mr. Harris Dawson, I, he, he shares my views, is that it's very, very important that our, um, uh, that our enforcement not just be LAPD, that we rely uh, much more on civil enforcement mechanisms. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think Chief Moore agrees with that approach, too. I mean, he's told us that he, he, he was very grateful for the, the, the DWP shutoff thing. It was a better use of department resources, and it was probably ultimately more successful. So, um, you know, I think we need to ask this task force to, to look more at uh, uh, civil enforcement remedies, um, you know, including you know, DBS padlocking, fencing, or securing unlawfully operating businesses. Uh, I, I think there was talk of creating a new classification for DBS inspectors with responsibility for non-criminal enforcement against illegal businesses. I think we actually approved that classification last year, and I think Mr. Harris Dawson and Mr. Krikorian had a, a motion asking for departments to report back uh, on using that as part of the enforcement strategy. So I'd like to see all of that as, as part of what the working group does. I'm a little confused about who's going to uh, sort of herd the cats in the working group, and I'm wondering if maybe we shouldn't add uh, the CLA's office to that group um, to, to, to help uh, convene and direct. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Especially if there are going to be additional policy recommendations, yeah. like uh, providing for board ups and other recommendations that may come out of the working group. It would certainly be helpful to have the... Yeah. Um, CLA and maybe even the CAO in, involved with that as well. Um, okay, any other questions for staff before we go to the public? No. Uh, council members, if yeah. I may, Arturo Martinez on behalf of the City Attorney's Office. I simply want to uh, uh, direct this committee to report number R18-0344 dated November 16th, 2018, as that letter um, uh, to council lays out all the City Attorney's efforts uh, through the date of that letter. Thank you. Thank and, you. And we have that before us, so thank you very much. Uh, all right. Thank you all. We're going to hear from the public now, so uh, we may be calling you up again when we're done. Okay, so you all saw how we do this, filling up the front table. So I'm going to ask uh, our first speakers to come on up. Jana Kahn, Sarah Armstrong, and Donnie Anderson, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jana Khan. 
I've been to a lot of these meetings about enforcement, and I think the biggest issue I have, and just even sitting here just right now and listening, because I had something prepared to say, and now I've changed my mind. I think you guys need to start looking to the state to do some of your enforcement and let the DCR do the enforce, do the business licensing and get us through licensing and applications, which have become, in my opinion, as an applicant, uh, really, a, really a hard, hard thing to do. Um, Cal OSHA, along with the California Tax Authority, they knock and they go door to door and they knock on every door in every business in this city. And they certainly have the means to do this regulation without all these lawyers, all these all this other stuff that you do. I, I don't know, since they do go door to door, why don't you just employ them and let them do the regulation? Kalosh has the ability to close a store in a $10,000 fine a day. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Sarah Armstrong, followed by Donnie Anderson, followed by Bambi Salcedo. Hi, sir. Gentlemen, I am Sarah Armstrong, Director of Industry Affairs for Americans for Safe Access and the Policy Chair for the Southern California Coalition. You should have a letter in front of you from both organizations asking you in the strongest possible terms to grant Cat Packers requests for funding. It is so important for social equity. We also feel very strongly that enforcement must take place against illegal retail shops. By law, these people cannot test their medicine. Buys done undercover and then tested showed that much of this product contained cancer-causing pesticides and other things that are very unhealthful for medical cannabis patients. I would urge you in the strongest possible terms to test the medicine that comes out of these uh, organizations that you're closing. And if you find that they are poisoning the people that they are selling it to, that you prosecute them in the strongest possible terms. Or you will not only have cancer coming out of Santa Susana, but these chemicals cause cancer as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, is Donnie Anderson here? Uh, okay. uh, our next speaker then will be Bambi Salcedo, followed by Lisa Saborio, followed by Fanny Guzman. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bambi Salcedo, and I am part of the Trans Latino Coalition, but I'm also a member of the Equity First LA Coalition. I am addressing item 13 on this agenda, and we support funding the DCR initially to follow with the DCR's budget, but we also support recommendation number two, and that it should include a 25% 20, share of the cannabis tax revenue collected with $10 million of equity money released immediately and $5 million of continuous funding for a community reinvestment plan. Increasing the already massive LAPD budget is not the primary way to support community, community reinvestment. LAPD should not get all the money. We stress the program funding should not be limited for three years. Generational wealth, as we understand, cannot be created in this time frame. The funding should roll over if and use, not revert to the general fund. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, our, next, our next speaker is uh, Lisa Saborio, followed by Fanny Guzman, followed by Kristen Lovell. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. I am Lisa Saborio. I would just uh, like to reiterate that uh, CAT should be given the money requested. I also support that there should be a, that should be the, a base amount and that a percentage based on tax revenues as well as other monies, uh, potentially some sort of public-private partnership and start talking to the retailers so that there can be innovative ways to raise money and percentage of the proceeds can go back into the social equity program might be a way to help the community kind of engage and uh, support the social equity program because I find that community reinvestment is also very important and has not yet, at least uh, in what I've read, been addressed. Um, the communities have been impacted. That's the whole reason the social equity program exists and money should go back into those communities as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, second call for Donnie Anderson. Okay. So, um, our next speaker will be Fanny Guzman, followed by Kristen Lovell, followed by uh, Gabrielle Guzman. 
Hi, Hi. my name is Fanny Guzman. I am co-founder of Latinos for Cannabis. I am also here as a member of the Equity First LA Coalition, and we're addressing number uh, item number 13. Um, aside from supporting the $3 million fund for CAT, we are also requesting that 25% of cannabis revenue should be set aside every year in non-reverting line item in the city in the city budget and programmed by the community in conjunction with the DCR. DCR's director sh should not be requesting the resources every year. She should be presenting programming plan for approval only. Any funds not expended each fiscal year should stay within the department because the damage is so deep and wide in our community that there may be events that will require us saving money for the years to come. Measure M empowers you to establish this structure because Measure M calls on you not to not only seek social equity but social justice. Enforcement without, out, without opportunity is a broken paradigm and we cannot continue talking about enforcement without opportunity being made available. Our next, our next speaker is Kristen Lovell, followed by Gabriel Guzman, followed by Felicia Carvajal. Hi. Um, my name is Kristen Lovell, and I am one of your constituents, and I also am a member of the Equity First LA Coalition. And as you've heard, uh, we do support you funding CAT, and we also look forward to um, the discussion about including a 25% share of the tax revenue collected. Um, and additionally, that $10 million of the equity money should be released, and $5 million of continuous funding for the community reinvestment plan. We also call for all community benefit plans of all license holders, including phase one, to be made public to promote oversight um, by our consumers um, and community watch dog groups. 80% um, of voters approved Measure M, which requires the council to address historical issues of social equity and social justice. So far, there has been limited follow through. So we ask to honor this vote. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Gabriel Guzman, followed by Felicia Carbajal, followed by uh, Tomer Graciani. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Gabriel Guzman. I am a co-founder of Latinos for Cannabis. Uh, in addition, I am here on behalf of uh, Equity First LA Coalition, and I am addressing item 13 on this agenda. We support recommendation number two, and that it should include a 25% share of the cannabis tax revenue collected with $10 million of equity money released immediately and $5 million of continuous funding for a community reinvestment plan. Uh, again, as, as it was echoed earlier, increasing the already massive LAPD budget is not the primary way to support community reinvestment. LAPD should not begin all this money. Um, you can control three out of every four dollars to fund the department, pay for enforcement, and enhance whatever city services you see worthy of this revenue. The community in conjunction with the DCR should program the remaining one, out of, one dollar out of every four to heal these communities. Don't make these communities beg for help. Recognize the scope of injury and foster a private-public partnership that the rest of the country will be proud to follow. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Felicia Carbajal, followed by Tomer Graciani, followed by Mauro Melgar. My name is Felicia Carbajal, one of the Equity First LA organizers. Cesar Chavez once said, the fight is never about grapes or lettuce, it's about people. Those words were never truer today and in this room. This fight isn't about licenses or funding. This is about the people in this room in particular. This is about healing the generational effects of the war on drugs for Angelinos. Of course, we're asking you to fund the $3 million that's necessary and to invest in the DCR's success. So I'll echo everything that everyone else has said, but we also are asking when you put this working group together that there's some kind of citizen oversight on that committee as well. Social justice and equity was supposed to be the moral compass for the cannabis industry. It was supposed to right the wrongs and heal some of the harms from the war on drugs. We're asking this budget committee to set us on that path to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Tomer Graciani, followed by Mauro Melgar, followed by Jason Williams. Hi, my name is Tomer Graciani. I'm an applicant for phase two for licensing. 
I'd like to talk a little bit about the enforcement uh, efforts of the city. I feel I've been come, I mean, I've been a uh, resident of LA for about four years, and I feel like a lot of money has been spent on enforcement, and I don't see any results. I'm kind of tired of having my tax money being spent on the same things over and over again, trying to plug, um, you know, holes in a dam with ice. Basically, nothing is changing. Instead of that, why don't we engage some of these dispensaries, see if maybe some of their owners are social equity um, applicants. I can tell you that the best way to try and close them down is to try and make them go legitimate. Because if you try to apply for a license, um, you're going to find out that it costs a lot of money and a lot of them will just shut down. Doing the same things that you've been doing again and again is not going to get any new results. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, I'm going to ask that you please not disturb the speakers um, with applause or booze or anything else because we're trying to pay. They only have a minute to speak. It's not very much time. We're trying to pay attention. So please, if you can, just keep your reactions uh, between speakers, if you will, please. Um, okay. Our next speaker is Mauro Melgar, followed by Jason Williams, followed by Zion Lencho. All my life, I've been grinding all my life, sacrificed, hustled, paid for the price. Want to, want to slice? You got to roll the dice. It took for this man to die for the mayor of Los Angeles to acknowledge his progress and contributions back into his community. That ain't right. For sales of marijuana, you guys gave me a, a one-year first-class tour of the Hotel of California, Los Angeles County Jail. I was labeled a felon for 10 years instead of a cannabis business entrepreneur. Against all odds, I aimed my focus towards my father's auto glass business in Sun Valley, California. I mastered the craft and have held it down and contributed to the city and the state for the past 10 years. I'm here to demand funding for social equity programs for those that have been negatively impacted by the prohibition of marijuana. You guys make money off of us going to jail and off of us being out here. Where does our money go to? Because it's not being reinvested into the community. LAPD has already and continues to profit off the war on drugs. I'm just trying to participate, generate, and provide for my family and pave the way for better days as a struggling father and taxpaying business owner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Jason Williams here? Jason Williams? Okay. Uh, our next speaker then will be Zion Lencho, followed by, oh, is Jasmine Aguiar here? Okay. Uh, Zion Lencho, Jasmine Aguiar, and Adam Vine, please. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Dion Lencho, and I'm in town from Oakland, California, and I'm going to cede the rest of my time to an actual Angelino. I just want to come down here, having worked on this social equity program in Oakland, and make three observations. One, the $3 million amount that Cat Packer is requesting today is very modest, and I look forward to your discussions over the next two months to see how to actually substantively support the program. Oakland earmarked $3.4 million, thinking they were going to have 30 businesses, and they lead the state in licensing. And when you're talking about providing substantive support, I'm an attorney. I've worked for several companies, and I know what it takes to be compliant, and they are not ready. Um, secondly, I would observe that when we're talking about enforcement, it's important that it be civil than criminal. Um, and I, I echo the council member on that point. Um, we have a lot of damage in these communities, and law enforcement isn't always the most nuanced approach. And then finally, I will say that it's really important that you also provide loan assistance. It's impossible to get funding. We don't have access to banking. And if you want a substantive program, you need to actually provide the dollars. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is a Last time, Jasmine Aguiar. I'm right here. Oh, you are here. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, who will be followed by Adam Vine and Christina Marsh. Hello. Uh, my name is Jasmine Aguiar. I'm the president of the working group and a phase two tier two social equity applicant. I was born and raised in South Central LA and represent the community that, was, that has been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. The working group would like to point out two current barriers of entry for Angelinos. Tier 1 classification allows for any person in California to receive priority processing and resources over Angelino residents who live in qualified zip codes. The working group requests that budgeting committee require minimum of seven-year residency in qualified zip codes for all Tier 1 applica applicants. The working group requests that uh, the budgeting committee suspend all phase three rollout application acceptance and processing until the social equity program for phase two social equity 
applicants is fully funded. I submitted supporting documentation to all of my comments to your respective offices. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is Jason Williams here? Last call? No? Okay. So our next speaker will be Adam Vine, followed by Christina Marsh, followed by Stephanie Abbott. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Adam Vine. I, too, am a member of the Equity First LA Coalition. And I'm here also to support Director Packer's $3 million request. But beyond that, we support the recommendation number two, that it should overwhelmingly include 25% share of the tax, cannabis tax revenue collected, as was initially recommended in the AMAC Wheeler Social Equity Study. We ask that $10 million of equity money be, rele be released immediately in this fiscal year, and $5 million of continuous funding for a community reinvestment plan. We stress also that program funding should not be limited to three years. Generational wealth cannot be created in that time frame. The funding should roll over if unused, not revert to the general fund. Beyond that, this city has been prosecuting the war on drugs for over 100 years now, and it should take that into account when it starts funding this program. So please, we urge you to fund this program, fund it fully, and make it continuous. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Christina Marsh, followed by Stephanie Abbott, followed by Moises Estrada. Hi, my name is Christina Marsh, and I'm a business owner and a social equity applicant. I'm not here about that today, though. I'm here to ask that you fund the social equity program, not for myself, but I, know, I have a large, large uh, group of Latino men in Pico Union area of downtown LA who are now lost because they have no uh, way to support themselves anymore because cannabis has been their lives. They've been enslaved to it since they were 14 years old, but they don't even know a program exists. And these are the, the people that have helped Loki Lotion come up and heal the homeless. These are guys with big hearts and a lot of talent and it's being wasted in downtown LA. And this is the hardest thing I've ever done. And I fight cancer. I just want you guys to know, I know it's prohibition, I know it's hard, but guys, can we move a little faster? We're, we're, we're starving over here. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Stephanie Abbott, followed by Moises Estrada, followed by Hannah. No last name. Um, my name is Stephanie. Um, good afternoon to all the people. I'm here as an applicant and an activist for social equity. I come today to speak out for my community that I've been in for 30 years. I was raised in Lamert Park. As a whole, we need funding for social equity so that our families can live a better... Excuse me. Give me one minute. <laughs> so that our families can, can live a better and safe environment, giving our children the benefit of attending better schools. We are willing and ready to learn to comply with all the rules and regulations of licensing and would appreciate it if you would set aside funding for social equity program. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Moises Estrada, followed by Hannah, followed by... Uh, Ariane Edmondson. Hello, my name is Moises Estrada, and I'm here representing 1123 Group, which I'm a co-founder of. We are social e equity applicants. Um, I'm a social tier one social equity applicant, and I hold uh, tier two temporary licenses, which we are in jeopardy of losing because of all the obstacles that we have to endure with non-enforcement, uh, non uh, non just uh, being able to get through building and safety, being able to get through the uh, Department of Water and Power, being able to get a certificate of occupancy. Right now, we were just informed that we're not going to be able to get our power upgrade, which the city, the Department of Water and Power guaranteed us about eight months ago. And now they are not being able to give it to us because we have about eight illegal operations on our block. Eight illegal operations on our block taking up power that we should be getting and that's why I'm here for you guys to support Ms. Cat Packard and her efforts to help us. So social equity people are out there suffering right now. Thank you. Uh, are you Hannah? Yes. Okay. Uh, Hannah will be followed by Ariane Edmondson and Rabin Woods. 
Hi, good afternoon. My name is Hannah Yi, and I'm with the Coalition to Prevent Alcohol-Related Harms in the LA Metro. I work with youth in LA County, and I've witnessed many experiences of youth rising up to resiliency despite inequities due to youth prevention programs. Many of my youth come out of prevention programs with backgrounds surrounding substance abuse with their friends and family, and now they're mobilized to be advocates in the community. In fact, my youth are currently pouring in the community right now and providing prevention education workshops to their peers and younger students. And all this was possible because of the funding to youth prevention programs. I ask you to consider providing these funds because these youth would not be the leaders they are today. In addition, these funds will allow us to continue providing safe spaces for the youth and community. Thank you, and I hope you'll continue pouring into these programs. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Ariane Edmondson, followed by Rabin Woods, followed by Kika Keith. Good afternoon. I'm not Ariane. But my name is Raven Woods, and I am a social equity applicant, and I wanted to address the, uh, the pink elephant in the room, basically. Uh, the social equity represents for me and the people that I know a, a chance at being financially free, gives the ability to actually help raise children. You know, uh, I'll probably never get the 40 acres of the mule, but if you give me 40 units in a dispensary, I'm going to be able to do a whole lot. Uh, I say that because today I, I am the founder of a nonprofit I've had for 18 years. I house victims of domestic violence, human trafficking, homeless veterans. I help uh, people coming out of prison get jobs, change their mindset, uh, make the streets safe as possible. And that's all without any cannabis if I get the assistance of being able to be a social equity applicant and get a dispensary a cultivation, something like that, I will be able to do a whole lot more. And I think Kat Packer needs to be giving, giving the money that she's asked for, and hopefully you'll be open-minded enough to do more when, it, when it's needed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, our next speaker is Kika, well, is Ariane Edmondson here? There, we'll give that one more try. Kika Keith. Uh, who will be followed by Ignite Daniel and Whitney Beatty. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Kika Keith. I am a member of Life Development Group. I'm here not only representing myself, but members of the 8th, 9th, and 10th District. I'm a single mother of three, a Tier 1 social equity applicant that has been raised in South Central Los Angeles as well as raised my children. And I've seen this as a vehicle for self-sufficiency. I've been holding on to a property in the Crenshaw District, a retail compliant property, for the past nine months. And we are anxiously awaiting funds to be allocated to the social equity program to get things started. Um, I've brought letters from multiple social equity applicants that are in my same position that are having hardships because we're waiting. There is no education happening in our community. While we're waiting on these programs to be started, we could be training and regulation and compliance, the core things that are going to be required for us to be successful. It is not happening. These are simple tools, tools that don't require a lot of money. It just requires prioritization, which we were supposed to have. Right, that motion was passed in 2017. We've been fighting since then, and I greatly appreciate if you guys would authorize funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, La last call for Ariane Edmondson. Not here? Okay. So our next speaker will be Ignite Daniel, followed by Whitney Beatty, <clears throat> followed by Mushir Shabazz. Greetings, Ignite with Life Development Group. Um, we have been working diligently with social equity applicants in the Los Angeles area to prepare them for licensing, compliance, and to know what it takes in order to be business owners because we know that our community was left out of the core tools that um, come with running businesses purposefully, deliberately, our families were torn, torn apart, and funding, and, and, and it's, 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 it's unfortunate that we have to sit here and beg for funding for something that should have been provided to us from day one. Like we're basically begging for something that everyone else got as a community and we were deliberately left out of purposefully so that our families would be in the situations that we're in now. Um, it is a disservice to all of our children that have to go through what parents and grandparents are going through to make sure that food is on the table. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Whitney Beatty, followed by Mushir Shabazz, followed by Nasheed Shakir. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. My name is Whitney. I am CEO of Apothecary Brands. We are an ancillary company in cannabis. I'm also a future social equity applicant, and I am a board member for Supernova Women. We empower women of color to be stakeholders in this space. We're all very clear on the fact that communities of color have been disproportionately disenfranchised and that these social equity programs were created to help us level that playing field. Um, but this lack of funding is really dragging out that process and leaving us sidelined in the most critical growth period with the lowest barriers to entry ever. Um, and we're just missing out on that opportunity for generational wealth, and it's just not fair. Uh, we want to see Cat Packers funding requests approved at a bare minimum. And we further, we really want to see um, in the new budget that we prioritize real funding for this program, 25% share funding for this program, accountability for this program, citizen oversight for this program, um, and for a heck of a lot longer than three years because the war on drugs did not last three years. So we want to see that happen. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Is Mushir Shabazz here? Oh. I don't have my glasses, so I can't see, so I can't really judge your response. Oh. Well, co go ahead and come on, come on up, sir. Come on up. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Hold on, hold on. Just have, have a seat. Uh, so, Mr. Sh Mr. Shabazz will be followed by Nasheed Shakir, followed by Energy, followed by Lynn Lyman. So, go ahead, sir. Okay. When I, when I, I just want. To ask for some equity here. This is what is the social equity program, so you don't need to be equitable unless something's out of balance. And this thing is out of balance. I mean, Ray Charles can see that. Or you and I can see it anyway. Okay, so can we fix it? Can we fix it? We come into to, to the city council, to the one we say has got the city. You know, what is this city going to be? You got a few rich people in it? We want this to be the richest city in, in the world if possible. Everybody's got to participate for that to take place. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to make L.A. the spot. So you help everybody in the society, and we'll have the richest city. We'll have the best city. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, our next speaker is Nasheed Shakir, followed by Energy, followed by Lynn Lyman. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I am Nasheed Shakir. I'm a member of this community, uh, the community of Los Angeles, for 70 years, approximately 70 years. And uh, I am a proponent of <clears throat> this organization, which is structured to include us. And I personally know that we have been non-included for a long time as we, with respect to uh, our ethnicity and our opportunities. So therefore, my request is that you, those the people who are able to do the right thing, do the right thing. Fund this program. It's inevitable that we have a chance. And it's been sounded and spoken on for a long, long time. And so now it's time for us to do something. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Energy, followed by Lynn Lyman, followed by Bonita Money. Yes, sir. <clears throat> My name is Energy, and basically you heard everything. But what I want to say is that earlier you mentioned that the fact that people are out here dying, and a lot of the hopelessness and a lot of the, you know, fatalism and destructiveness come from the fact that every time the city get a chance to send the people a message, they, they take the selfish liberty to act in the interest of the racist and the rich. But the point I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, send a message to the people that, they're, that, they, that they matter. You know what I mean? And it we've lost on all fronts. This is a good time to send a simple message to the people that they have value. I don't think you should fund social equity. That's it. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Lynn Lyman, followed by Bonita Money, followed by Rick Ross. Good afternoon. My name is Lynn Lyman. I'm a member of the Equity First LA Coalition. Previously, I co-authored and co-chaired Proposition 64, the statewide uh, Adult Use of Marijuana Act. 
it's been over two years that we've been coming to city council, to, to committee meetings, to hearings, et cetera, and we've heard a lot of grandstanding about social equity, and while I believe that some of you actually believe in it, what we haven't seen is you put your money where your mouth is. It has been two years. Of course we demand the three million. That's ridiculous. They requested it in November. Not a penny has been spent yet on social equity in this city, and over a thousand licenses have been given out. Furthermore, we want to see 25% dedicated out of the cannabis revenue. Unlike the other conversations here today, we're raising this money. This is our money. We're buying weed and the taxes are coming and they've got to come back. We want to see full transparency on every penny raised through cannabis revenues. And we want the $10 million from the unappropriated balance that you all are going to give to LAPD and we want it now. Our next speaker is Bonita Money, followed by Rick Ross, followed by Dodd Sherrills. Daoud Sherrill. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bonita Money. I am the founder of Indica, which is a National Diversity and Inclusion Cannabis Alliance. I'm also part of the Equity First Coalition. And, you know, we need to fund DCR now. Please. I mean, the people of, of, of L.A. that actually were impacted by the war on drugs that should be getting this opportunity, they don't even know this program exists or they don't even believe it's true because we do not even have funding to do outreach. I mean, this is ridiculous. Right now, we need to be able to fund this program so we can move this along because I'm, I'm starting to wonder, is this even real? Yeah. So this is the big problem because the people of L.A. who really deserve this opportunity are losing faith. And that's why we need, again, to move this along and create a situation where we can create generational wealth for our people. And my thing right now is that we shouldn't, as organizations, my organization has been doing the work of the, the city. We've been doing the outreach, the mentorship, the training. The city should be doing this for their people. So please give these funds and please do not give the $10 million to LAPD. That needs to stay with the city, uh, with DCR, please. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rick Ross, followed by, um, I'm sorry, is it Dode? Dowd. Dowd. You can Dowd. whatever you want. Cheryl. Okay. Uh, followed by Sherry Franklin. Hi, my name is Rick Ross, and I think it's very important that you give the money to the DCR right now because continuing prohibition, like we hear you talking today about enforcement, 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 hasn't worked. The war on drugs has been going on for over 50 years. Um, I was sentenced when I was 28 years old, and my judge told me that he had sentenced his first drug dealer the year I was born. So that tells us that the war on drugs don't work. Enforcement is not going to work. Let's take the money and put it where it can start helping the people and show the people, like Energy said, that you do care and that we are going to do something different and not the same old throw them in jail, lock them up, throw away the key. It hasn't worked for all these years. It's not going to work now. Uh, we have to fight this a different way. And I think that supporting the people, showing the people that you do care, that there are programs out there to help you make a living. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sherrills, followed by Sherry Franklin, followed by Chauncey Bullock, followed by Ruben Honig. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Dawood Sherrells. I'm out of the 15th district and also I represent the Watts Neighborhood Council. I'm here in support of social, social equity and especially in the now, like they say, you know, uh, we've been holding on for so long and I mean, we don't know what's going on and we lose the hope in the city. I, have to, I had, had an opportunity to go to court and see eight young men get prosecuted, you know what I'm saying, in, in, in reference to uh, robbing the dispensary. And that was heartbreaking to me in knowing that this social equity is supposed to hopefully benefit them in some type of way. When I'm seeing young, uh, uh, when I'm seeing uh, eight young black men go to prison for robbing the dispensary, that's just saying that, you know, whatever's happening at the top level, it's not being trickled down to the, to the lower half. And uh, so with this, with this whole process in social equity, I think it's time for you guys to act now. Because, like I said, it's getting out of hand. We're going into the summer months, and uh, this whole thing of, of, of back and forth and communicate is not working. We need to do something now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, Sherry Franklin, followed by Chauncey Bullock, followed by Ruben Honig, followed by Javier Montes. 
Hi, Sheree Franklin, co-founder of Think and Grow Lab and Cannabis of Los Angeles and the Govardi Incubator. We have uh, seven licensed cultivators and manufacturers in our incubator. It costs approximately $1 million minimum to launch a cultivation business and approximately $1.5 to $2 million for manufacturing. As you can see, that is a large investment. You need all the things that any other business needs and more from attorneys and, and uh, business plans and, and paying taxes and all the things that help them uh, thrive, packaging, marketing, branding. You can't do it with limited funds. Uh, the city of Los Angeles, I know, uh, has put in more dollars in marketing and other things. I helped launch the Metro Business Source Center. You, uh, this, uh, that was a million dollars a year just for businesses along the Crenshaw line. So $3 million just for outreach. Uh, DCR needs more resources and also to work in partnership with other departments that have funding like the neighborhood councils. Rec and Park has money for outreach and planning. You can work with some of the, uh, with uh, EWDD, partner those and bring them to the table and have them provide curriculum and programs for cannabis. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sean Sipola. One second. I just wanted to make sure. a note here. <laughs> okay. No um, so, yes, thank you. Our next speaker will be Chauncey Bullock, followed by Ruben Honig, followed by Javier Montes, followed by Chris Malcolm. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Chauncey Bullock, the CEO of Greenhaven LA, CEO of uh, Go Verde Incubator, and a social equity applicant and a uh, 20 year uh, resident of uh, Council 8. We seem, I believe, to have a problem. That problem stems with where we know, for those of us that are business owners in the room or those wanting to be, that it actually takes money to make money. And I believe DCR has proved to you that they are perfectly capable of chasing their tail with all due respect. With them actually asking for a minor $3 million and only being given $250,000, that is just one big joke, and the joke is on us, and it's embarrassing. It behooves us to move forward, to look at items that are actually earmarked. When we find out in another meeting that we have $10 million that are earmarked for the industry, and that being taken away by the CAO at any given moment, we've got to move forward on making sure we do things properly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Ruben Honig, followed by Javier Montes, followed by Chris Malcolm. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Ruben Honig, and I'm the executive director of the United Cannabis Business Association. We represent licensed retailers, cannabis retailers in the city of Los Angeles, as well as throughout California and Sacramento as well. The UCBA continues to believe that the city of Los Angeles should prioritize communi com communities impacted by the failed war on drugs, especially those incarcerated for cannabis crimes. We support a social equity program and also strongly believe that the city must increase efforts to enforce on illegal operators. As we all know, this is a highly regulated and taxed industry, and the only way to be economically successful while maintaining good-paying jobs and benefits is to, be com is to compete on a level playing field with other cannabis businesses. The entire industry in the city's social equity program will fail if it competes with illicit sales that are 50, 40 to 50 percent cheaper than the legal alternative. We support DWP shutting off water and power of illegal operators. We support fining property owners up to $20,000 per day for renting to illegal shops, which have not gone out yet. We support cracking down on counterfeit products, and we especially support ensuring our communities have tested products for the safety of their constituents. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Javier Montes, followed by Chris Malcolm, followed by Spellman, followed by Dro. Good afternoon, my name is Javier Montes, Vice President of the United Cannabis Business Association. I am a li licensed operator since 2006 in CD15. It's been difficult at times, including now, when an illegal proliferation continues to take away from our communities and industry's ability to have good local hiring programs. Good tax revenue continues to move away from the general fund, which goes back to a lot of important issues and can help fund social equity and CATS department. I strongly support the funding of CATS department. As an experienced operator, if I'm having problems, how are new businesses supposed to succeed when they come online? We need to fix our problems now so that every new business in Los Angeles coming into cannabis is a successful business. I support DWP shutting down the utilities of illegal operators. I support the city attorney fining property owners up to $20,000 per day for renting to illegal operators. I support a strong foundation for social equity and for businesses in Los Angeles. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, sir. Um, our next speaker, well, our final speakers will be Chris Malcolm, Spellman, Dro and Bryant Mitchell. Chris Malcolm, 
Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mr. Spellman. I'd like to say that uh, I support the social equity program due to the fact that the spirit of entrepreneurship has been seen in our community that has been disenfranchised by this, by the assassination of Nipsey Hussle, who had an entrepreneur spirit to bring back something to the community. I think we need to embrace that concept. In my humble opinion, I believe that the uh, cannabis industry is starting to become like a college entry program where it's only for the rich and not for the poor. And I'm starting to get deja vu from it. This is not an indictment of anyone in particular, but have gun will travel. And if you don't give these opportunities to these people, then they're going to take them for themselves. And if we spend a million dollars a year per gang murder, per burial, and we have almost 300 murders a year, then I think it would be mathematically sensible for us to not invest into something so lucrative for the family as well as for those that are surrounding these communities. You guys are our elected officials. We are your constituents. In some cases, some of our elected officials, unlike you guys, speak for us but don't necessarily speak to us. So I'm going to let you know that we're here to protest and say that we want social justice and social equality as the Nazareth of this community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. How you doing? My name is Joe. Uh, I didn't believe in a lot of this um, kind of hoopla because I believe that the African Americans and Los Angeles have always been the back burner to everything. Everything. Um, and I started coming around and people kind of convinced me to come speak for the streets. And I didn't believe in it, but I want to know what you gentlemen did earlier. I think you guys are some class A guys. I think that you guys should understand that from me. I think that the African Americans have been left out of everything. You know it. Only thing they use us is, is puppets and entertainment, basketball, football. We run up and down these streets. But what about the people in the ghetto? The same people that spend their money to support the other people. What about those people? I support the sister cat. She's doing a great job. And I just ask y'all, man, do the right thing. You know what I'm saying? Sam Cook had a song that said change gonna come. We ain't looking for change no more. That's all we've been getting. We're looking for some real help now. Thank you, sir. Okay. Mr. Mitchell? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Brian Mitchell. I've been in the cannabis business now for about 14 years, currently operating as a uh, phase two uh, candidate. And let me tell you, it's not easy. And it, it's not a straightforward process. It's a lot of education that needs to be going on, a lot of uh, instructions that needs to be given so that these people that have a dream to be an entrepreneur and, and provide wealth to the system have an opportunity to be successful. That has to be done with starting at DCR. The other groups that are here to support the DCR are here to support it. $3 million is not enough. But listen, we'll make it work. And that's where we need to start. This money has to be given out as soon as possible if any of this is going to be realized. There's not any days to delay. There are other forces out there trying to stop this, as you know. There are people that are making this a lot harder than it should be. But the groups that are here to help are here to help today and they're willing to support DCR in any way possible. So that, need, that money needs to be released, and time is of the essence. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Um, that's all the speakers that I have on my list. Was there anybody else that I missed? OK, uh, great. Thank you. So uh, if I could ask Ms. Packer to come on uh, back up in case members have uh, questions that we want to discuss. Uh, and I'm going to start with Mr. Price. <clears throat> I just want to thank everyone for coming out uh, and for your testimony. Uh, it, it's very helpful uh, that we hear firsthand uh, what's happening uh, and that we uh, work with you in a collaborative way to come up with the kinds of solutions that uh, are going to make this program be successful. I believe in social equity. I think it's something that makes sense uh, in our city especially. Uh, I'm committed to seeing it through and I look forward to working with my colleagues uh, to make sure that we have the resources to make that possible. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bonner? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, yeah, I want to thank everybody for the testimony. Uh, I think it was very compelling. It, uh, it reminded me of a realization I had over the weekend. I was making a presentation to the Sierra Club about the Green New Deal, and I talked about the environment, and I talked about jobs, and I talked about equity. And I realized when I was doing the presentation, and I said equity third, that if I wasn't saying equity first, it probably wasn't equity. Um, and I, 
We, we made a really, really, really big promise when we did this in 2017. Remember, it was a big focus of the conversation. Uh, it was a big focus of the reason we did this. And um, I'm concerned that we're not putting the equity first. I, I see a lot of establishments in my district uh, that, are, that are there. And given the geographic restrictions and stuff like that, by the time we get to the people waiting in line, there's not going to be places in some of the more lucrative areas. Um, and uh, I, I think that, and I've heard the, the, the stories of people, uh, uh, particularly, I've, I've spoken to a couple of the people before uh, around the Crenshaw area who are, are holding properties and are spending a lot of money uh, waiting uh, the, the, you know, the, the rent there with the Crenshaw line coming is going up and it's getting more expensive and that's a burden on folks. Um, and th there are things that have been proposed and dis discussed in terms of the financing that are completely unusual, completely unheard of. I mean, we, we, we generally do not, you know, make multi-year funding commitments. We uh, are, are loath to, uh, you know, commit a percentage of, of, of revenue and stuff like that. It, it's, and we don't like making a commitment for future years because we don't like narrowing our choices in the future. But this is a circumstance where I'm, I'm, I'm willing to look at the situation differently because when we're talking about this issue and the, the, the ills that we're trying to undo, I mean, we're talking about I mean, the war on drugs, institutional racism, generation and generation, that effectively narrowed choices for people. So I, I, I think this is a, a rare case where we can think differently uh, because we're trying to, 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 to right a big wrong. Um, I, I thought, uh, Ms. Packer, you made a, uh, a, a very a good presentation about uh, why we uh, needed to provide the, the, the three-year stream that you talked about. Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned basically you're trying to fulfill a legal obligation that we put upon you uh, that uh, we can't move the system because of, because of our, our, our stated commitment to the social equity. We can't move the system uh, forward without it. And as a result, we're suffering all the revenue loss, the revenue for us, the revenue for you. Uh, and you, you mentioned how the, the, the permit you give is three years, and so it's sort of synchronized with the, the commitments would be synchronized. Um, the, the other reason I think, and I, in, in this regard, three years is too short, really, is um, given that we're trying to do something that is undoing sort of decades of harm, a three-year commitment is minimal. Um, so I, I don't know that I've ever thought about budgeting this way before, but in this case, I'm, I'm willing to because of what, what I think is the importance of it. So, Thank you. Thank you. It, so I, I'm, I'm okay. the, the recommendation from the, the committee was for the three year, yes? Correct. Yeah. Um, uh, that was item number five, I believe. So, uh, I'm, I'm in favor of that. I had a question about the um, the 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 other money. We talked about the, uh, the the money that was in the UB. We put money in the UB for this year for DCR. So the the way that the language around the UB was uh, crafted, I believe that it said something like. Uh, fun funding for uh, LAPD, sworn overtime, and other programs. Uh, we would argue that other programs uh, would consider cannabis programs to include the social equity program. Uh, social equity itself is not named uh, as a specific recipient of uh, that UB, uh, but, but we would uh, postulate to this committee uh, that other programs would include uh, what we're asking for. And has any of that money been spent? No. Uh, out of the UB? It has not. But by anybody? Wait. It, it, I, that, that's kind of, it, could, do we have the CAO yeah. representative here who can? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, Council Member Jacob Wexford, the Office of City Administrative Officer. The mid-year financial status report uh, did take, did use that money and transfer it to address the 
the shortfall in police took five million of that of that funds to use it for a police overtime shortfall. Okay. Wait, wait, folks! No, 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 no! Sorry, we don't do it this way. So five million dollars of the ten million dollars, five million dollars of the ten million dollars that was set aside specifically for police overtime and other programs was spent on police overtime. Correct. Okay, so there's still wait, folks. So there's still five million dollars left there that has been unspent and unappropriated, other than to the other programs or whatever. Correct. It has not been okay. appropriated this time. Okay. So there's five million dollars still left there. That's that's okay. Okay. Mr. Bond. Right. Yeah. Um, and the 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 fiscal year is almost over. Uh, in addition to the three million you're you're asking for for the. Uh, business license and compliance. Please, please don't interrupt members of the committee while they're speaking. Please. Uh, in addition, we have to maintain order in in the meeting so that we can get to the conclusion of it. Thanks. In addition to the business license and compliance money that, that we've talked about, the three. What what if anything? I want to pin this down. Does the department need or is asking for from that amount of money in the UB that could be used in the next 90 days? So we would ask for uh, the allocation of the original funding which we requested, which was the $2 million for the fee deferral program. I believe that 250 k of that uh, has been uh, maybe allocated but not dispersed to the department yet. Uh, but we would ask for, uh, if, there are, if there are monies to be made available, uh, we would ask specifically to shore up the initial request. Uh, again, part of the challenge is, is that we can't begin to uh, administer our programs, uh, and we have phase three programs that are contingent upon us starting uh, business licensing and compliance assistance. Uh, the Rules Committee right now is, is considering instructing the department not to begin phase three at all until business licensing and compliance assistance is available. Uh, and if that would be the case, then we are in this situation where the city can't even receive new tax revenues until there is an investment made into this program to allow us to move forward as required by law. How much of that could you spend before the end of the fiscal year? Uh, if you gave it to us, we could spend, uh, there, there are hundreds of folks who have applied uh, for phase two. Uh, and they are entitled to business licensing compliance assistance, and they haven't gotten uh, any of that because there has been no programming uh, made available to them. Uh, so it's both us needing to retroactively provide support to applicants who are already in our pipeline, mm -hmm. and then also uh, moving resources to allow us to move forward to start phase three and provide that programmatic assistance to new businesses. We Council member, yeah. hopefully to answer your question, it's unlikely we would be able to actually expend the money within the next 90 days. Um, we do have an RFQ um, in final draft development, or we're working, working very closely with the city attorney's office to have bench contracts set up so that once we know what would be appropriated for the social equity program, we can establish those contracts and do mini bids for actual services tied to the social equity program and begin expending those dollars in July and August of next year. Um, a lot of the policy development around the social equity, what areas of the city need to be assisted through that program, um, the uh, Rules Committee and the Council has adopted additional social equity studies which may expand um, the areas that are subject to social equity and the ability of those funds may go beyond what was an originally analyzed. Um, by having this RFQ in the bench, it's going to allow us to expend the dollars to basically mimic what the final decisions are, but it's unlikely we would be able to start spending those dollars until July or August. So it would probably be better for it to be a, an appropriation for the fiscal year 2019-2020 so that we can begin to start doing the it's folks please sorry sorry we have to have this discussion with our staff now we spent well over I, I don't know an hour and a half we we heard everything that everybody had to say so let us finish our conversation let us finish our conversation please what would happen is we're, we're so far along in the fiscal year if the funds were appropriated because it is a general fund it would revert at the end of the year and then we would have to request for it to revert back to us in July when council comes back for recess so we believe that there has been the commitment to give us funding for the social equity program and we wouldn't actually be in a position to start expending those dollars until July or August once those contracts are set up which puts us in next fiscal year. So we're not saying we don't want the money because we do want the money but to answer your question we're not in a position to expend that money within the next 90 days. But, folks, what, what, I'm going to ask Ms. Packer her opinion of this as well but there's, there's 
this will sound counterintuitive, but there is a logical argument to not giving them money that they won't be able to spend before June 30. It will look worse for the department if we give them money they don't spend than if we give it to them when, it, when we know they can spend it. It will actually hurt will their long-term efforts if we give them money and then there's a lot of cash in the budget June 30. Uh, and we don't want to set them up for failure that way. So. Uh, you concur with, 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 with Jason, or is there stuff from the UB that you need before June 30? There, there are a couple of nuances to, to this piece. We requested $2 million originally for the fee deferral program. Uh, unfortunately, the fee deferral program wasn't established until after we started Phase 2. So we started our Phase 2 application process, which was specifically for social equity applicants. And then after we began administering the Phase 2 application process, the council passed a fee deferral program. And it only funded the, f the program, and again, those funds haven't even been received yet, it only funded the f program for 250 k So there were applicants who we had to blanket deny the opportunity for a fee deferral because we did not have the funds to even be able to allocate to receive and process those 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 uh, applications. I imagine that there would be a mechanism by which if we were allocated uh, money that we had requested previously, we could open up the pool of applicants who could qualify uh, for the fee deferral program. But because of some of the mechanisms uh, and the order in which things happened, uh, we were limited in the pool of applicants that we could even apply that 250 k that has not yet become available. As Jason had said, the department is taking affirmative steps to begin to uh, finalize and publish our RFQ, uh, but there are steps that still need to be taken internally before we would actually be able to uh, sign and execute contracts, thereby using those dollars. Okay, my, my, my last question, I'm, and I'll, I'll tell you what I'm trying to do. Uh, I, I don't know if it, if it will work or if it makes sense. I'm supportive of the committee recommendation number five about the, the, the three million three year thing. Um, I'm, I'd, I'd be willing to make a motion to give you some of the, the, the UB money if I, if I was confident and you were confident you could spend it before the end of the year. C can, you, can you give me a number of that that you are confident you could spend before the end of the year? Because I don't, I don't want to set you guys up for failure. Right. I mean... And, and, it's like a congressional and, and, and actually, actually while, while you're thinking about that, if I could just throw in, you know, we, we've been talking about funding for the business licensing and compliance expenditures. I get that that takes some time. You just raised another possibility that could be more quickly implemented, perhaps, with the, um, the fee Defer deferrals. Correct. And that um, and then the the other really big component that I heard mentioned through a lot of the public comment was outreach. Mm -hmm. And um, sorry, Mr. Bond, I didn't, I didn't no, mean go, to take go you off track, it. but but this one has bugged me a lot, even since we started talking about social equity, because my concern has always been that our social equity programming will end up ignoring the people who are most in need of social equity and will go instead to people who are in the know mm -hmm. with the money, with the lobbyists and so on, who then get somebody, yeah. you know, who has a record and say, well, this is my CEO now. That, that's always been my concern about this program and that neighborhoods that are implemented get left out, yep. or that, that have been impacted rather. So. Is there something, and somebody, we don't usually like to have, you know, answers shouted out from the audience, but, 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 the, but, but this, is, this is actually a pretty good one. The, the work source centers and business source centers that we have already set up throughout the city who do this every day with other kinds of small businesses, I mean, that wouldn't be funding that would directly go into your department necessarily, but would there be an opportunity to utilize them to do the kind of outreach that, that you know, is most in need? So what I'd like, what I would like to be able to do is to request the uh, original funds that we had requested, the, the uh, full two million uh, coming out of the UB that would be used for the fee deferral program and to launch initial outreach and education around the social equity program. Uh, I think that 
it would have to be done largely in-house or with some of these business source centers. We have had preliminary conversations with the business source centers about them engaging on cannabis-related activity. And part of the challenge is, is that because they are federally funded, many of the business source centers do not want to touch cannabis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that there are internal yeah. conversations. Yeah. This is part of the reason why we have a social equity program generally. The business source centers probably could do the work, but because uh, of the federal illegality uh, and because of their federal funding, uh, they are uh, kind of hesitant to touch that funding. So what would I like, what I would like to be able to ask this committee, if there is going to be allocations made uh, out of the unappropriated balance uh, that would be granted what we originally asked for, and that we use that money for fee deferrals and to launch initial outreach and education for the program. I'll make that motion. Now, look, I'll second it. But let me ask you this. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the outreach, you're talking about a, a, uh, an outreach program to prospective applicants and how the program works, et cetera. I mean, isn't that going to be – you're splitting that with the, with the deferrals? Uh, how, how much do you see going to each? So I, I think that there has already been money that has been allocated for uh, the fee deferral program, and what we've determined is that with the monies that have been allocated uh, originally, we would be able to – have fee deferrals for only 31 applicants. We had over we have over 420 active applications. So again, when I say that we are only able to allocate fee deferrals to a small subset of folks, we would like to be able to greatly expand the number of folks that we're able to provide services to. And then yes, we want to be doing outreach and communication directly in the communities that have been most impacted. Right. Uh, and that would involve DCR staff going out and working with some of these organizations that are represented here today uh, to get the word out. How much for fee deferrals of the two million? Would you guesstimate half? Uh, I think that we want to use at least one point two five uh, for the the fee deferral program. And again, th these are deferrals. So once a business is up and running, that is recouped. Correct. Yeah. It essentially, is a revolving fund. <clears throat> So again, I'm sorry, 1.5 million is how many businesses? Are? I'm sorry, we, we, we want to do 1.25. What we've determined is that depending on how quickly these, these uh, businesses remit the, the uh, monies back, we could potentially have a total of uh, the 31 businesses, once they pay their fees, actually create uh, around uh, a pool of what, 124 uh, fees that can be allocated. So they actually create capacity just by uh, offsetting the initial fund that needs to be directed. So with an additional $1 million, I imagine that we'd be able to increase uh, that particular uh, amount of services for uh, four times, fourfold, uh, but we would like to be able to use some of the resources in the unappropriate balance right now uh, if we're able to do so to start that programmatic uh, assistance for education and uh, outreach. outreach. Part of the challenge right now is that, and, and some of the stakeholders mentioned this today, there are private entities who are doing the work that the department is supposed to be conducting right now. And with no uniformity. With no uniformity and not always with accuracy. <laughs> Uh, and this is part of the reason why we have these predatory practices that many of the communities have been talking about. In absence of the city providing its programmatic support, private entities are stepping into this space and saying, if you need a social equity license, you need to work with me or you're not going to get one. And, and they know that because the city hasn't provided the technical support. It's not just uh, finances that are a barrier, it's information. Information is the what I've recognized as the number one barrier, and there are only certain people who have uh, the information, and we want to be able to go out into the community so that all applicants have uh, access to equitable information. All right. Anything else, members? Sounds like we got something in the works. Um, so... Uh, Let's, why don't we, why don't we work off of the, uh, well, wait, first of all, I, I, sorry, I know we're, it's late and we're keeping everybody, um, but there were a couple of points that I didn't want to lose track of, mostly dealing with enforcement. Um, one of the speakers mentioned, uh, in fact, our first speaker mentioned uh, utilizing state agencies like Cal OSHA. Um, has, has there been any effort to, to do that yet with the 
and I don't know, maybe Kat, you're not the right person to ask, but maybe you do know. Are you, are you just asking generally if we're coordinating with state agencies on an enforcement strategy? Yeah, and Palo Alto seems like a particularly good, effective idea. Yes, there are a number of agencies uh, at the state level that we're coordinating with that have some of these enforcement tools that are relevant. What we plan to be able to do, and, and DCR plans to kind of sit, sit or stage as this task force comes together for enforcement, but what we'd like to be able to do is invite uh, Cal OSHA, the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, they have penalties that can be used. And again, it still sits in line with the trend in the city shifting from uh, primarily criminal enforcement to civil and administrative enforcement. Right. The truth of the matter is that Proposition 64 took away many of the criminal penalties. Yeah. That's not even the conversation that we're having exactly. anymore in the city. Uh, but we do need to be able to utilize some of these other tools, and I think that the state agencies have some of those tools that we'd and like to be able to partner Cal OSHA with. can shut down a bad actor today. Uh, right like that. So, okay. Um, so that's good to know. And then um, one of our other speakers mentioned, in fact, several speakers mentioned um, citizen oversight of the enforcement working group and the development of enforcement strategy and so on. So what would be your view of how citizen engagement would be included in the working group process? I think that there needs to be, uh, while there there may be kind of a resistance and, and meaningful resistance to uh, having uh, members of the general public have access to details around how the city specifically engages as enforcement, LAPD doesn't even share specific information with us uh, related to how they take specific enforcement actions. But I do think that there needs to be an extreme amount of transparency around enforcement. Uh, I think that there needs to be data collection that comes out of this enforcement committee. There, we, we spent... We spent money on a social equity analysis looking retroactively. It would be a shame if we see those same disparities happen in 2018 and 2019. So there needs to be data collection. I think that we need to be looking, and hopefully the trend is that we see disparities decrease over time, not have disparities increase over time. Uh, and I think that uh, it, would, it would be a meaningful addition to have uh, not just any citizen, but a citizen who is an impacted individual uh, Yes. impacted by the drug war, uh, be on that committee as well. Okay. okay. Um, I think that's, that's a policy development question probably for a, a later day, but um, when we do have, we do have before us members the recommendations of the Rules and Elections Committee, um, and I think we've developed a few potential modifications or additions to that. Um, First of all, on the uh, first recommendation that deals with um, report, reporting on the establishment of a complaint information system, sounds like we have some work to do on that, but I think we would all concur with that first recommendation for the need to, um, to establish that complaint information system. Um, item number two, dealing with the um, uh, enforcement uh, working group. I think it sounded like we would like to reinforce that instruction that the working group um, be set up uh, and manage and direct enforcement efforts. Um, but I think uh, we would also, uh, at Mr. Bonin's suggestion, like to add the CLA to that working group. And um, I, I noticed in the report that planning has no enforcement role in this. Um, and I don't know what the thought process was on there. I suspect everybody, it's a little hot potato. People don't want to, you know, necessarily be involved in it. But, but wouldn't they be the best suited to identify the, who the property owners are and take enforcement actions against the property owners or, um, or at least do the cease and desist letters to the property owners? P planning participates in the process because commercial cannabis activity is not an enumerated use. There's not an activity or a function that they can take against a particular property owner. Um, normally, if it's going to be a revocation of a CO or a CFO or something else, um, that falls under building and safety. Um, okay. They're part of the conversation. They're part of the process, but they don't really have any tools right now that they could utilize to get people to be more compliant. But, but they would be accessible to the working group it, to get the kind of information that we need, like the identity of property absolutely. owners. Having that, the ability to okay. tie into Zemus and look at records and everything Fine. else. And, That's good. And then I would just say add, add the CLA to that recommendation. Sorry, Ms. Packer, go ahead. I don't, uh, 
I think that there are going to be other agencies that we that we find might have tools. Uh, sanitation may have tools, for example, if there's discharge uh, happening in the to the environment or related to some of these businesses. So it, it really just depends on the nature of what the activity is. I don't think that we need to uh, write off any particular uh, agency as being considered, but there are some core uh, agencies that have been meeting together for the course of the over over a year at this point to try and pull this activity to, together. Well, and the, and the direction says, and other relevant offices or departments. I mean, it's not exclusive to, to those. They can always be pulled in. Yeah, okay. All right. So we'll add CLA to recommendation number two. Uh, recommendation number three uh, sounds like it's already underway, but we want to reemphasize in, in this case, DCR is being instructed to. Um, to report with the cease and desist letters, but it sounds like LAP is, LAPD is actually administering it. Yes, so, they are. Okay. Um, four, instruct the CLA and the CAO to report on illegal enforcement budget needs. Um, I assume you'll be doing that in a more robust way over the next few months, <laughs> and, and we'll be getting that for next year's budget. Um, so any suggestions on that or is that good as is? I think it's good. Okay. So item number five then is uh, the request for the three million dollars. Uh, this, um, the rules report says to fund the social equity program but at Ms. Packer's request I think that should be amended in our report to specify business licensing and compliance program. Yes, thank right. you. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, and I, I have to say this I guess. Um, Mr. Bonin, I, I have more heartburn than you do about multi-year budgeting. I Only wanted to hand you some roll aids even as I was saying it. <laughs> Only because we do not do that in anything else. Not one thing in the city budget is budgeted over more than one year. We don't even have a mechanism by which to do that. Um, the, the, the one thing that I think makes me feel a little bit more comfortable with that is that what we're doing is asking a city attorney to draft an ordinance providing for that. Um, that, ordinance could be changed. Yeah. that ordinance could be changed in any given budget year. So um, I think for consistency's sake, even though it's, it's a precedent that I am really reluctant to, to, to suggest, um, I, think, I think I can live with that. Mr. Price, what do you think? I think, I think you can live with it, too. Okay. All right. <laughs> Okay. The, the box of antacid is on me. Yeah, I'm telling you, though. <laughs> um, okay, so, and then item number six uh, seems fine as it is, uh, unless... I would just say, where it says CLA report with an analysis on youth development funding uh, and uh, further social equity program needs. Yes. I, mean, I think that comes yeah, in the budget. That might I think come. That's yes. Because we, yeah. I think included would be community reinvestment, but yeah. however, whatever the bigger umbrella is, that's right. what we'd like to be included. It captures the stuff that you were talking about that that is not in item five. Correct. Yeah. So you know what? As long as we're doing this, and I'm sorry to burden you with more reporting, but I, it, it seems to me from the course of the discussion that we've had today, from the delays that we've had in implementation, um, I. I I just have the sense that there's some fundamental policy gaps in this larger policy and specifically in the social equity program. Um, so I, I would like that report to not just include where gaps in current funding exist, but also where there are policy defects that need to be revisited yeah. uh, by the council. So I'd like to get your recommendation, CLA and CAO, on that as well. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, and then in addition, I, I just have one other Council addition. Council member, the, yes. the, can, can we be included on that instruction so that we can give direct feedback? Oh, yes. No, I, I thought that you were, but okay. um, I, I in, intended you to be, yes. Thank you. So on, on number six. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to add to this uh, an instruction to DCR to submit an annual budget and spending plan uh, for the social equity program um, and to instruct the DC, DCR, CAO, and city attorney to report back on whether cannabis regulation special revenue funds uh, can be used to fund the social equity program. So whether there are any legal or policy concerns in, in doing so. And the question is whether or not the fund itself, the special fund itself, yes. can be used to fund the Yes. Okay, thank you. Given that it's fee-based. 
So, all right. Uh, what about the UB piece? <laughs> Do you like? Would you like to make a proposal? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I made so, the motion. Current second is so. Okay, okay so oh, we did. Yeah, we already moved it. Yeah. So, um, to recap, that was to for what amount? Five billion. No, 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 it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, pal. <laughs> I didn't learn to be the budget chair by mail order, my friends. So. Um, it, it, was, it sounded like after the end of the session, I thought that Kat's, I thought that Kat said that she could spend 1.5. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 1.5. Yep. So, okay. That's so, um, that's what we will uh, yeah. we'll do then, without objection. Okay, so, get all that down? Yes. Mr. Choi, okay, sorry. So, without objection, all of that that I just said will be the action of the committee. So, thank you all very much. And thank you all for coming down and participating in this. It, it matters that you all stay involved. So thank you. Thank you for coming out and speaking. Okay, I'm sorry. We have to, we have to get general public comment done. All right. Sorry. So, folks, we're not done with our business. If I can ask you to keep your voices down, please. Folks, I still have to have order. We still are not done with our business. So our only remaining item on the agenda is general public comment. So... We have quite a few people wanting to speak. I, folks, I need to have silence in the room, please, because we have many more speakers still. Please. So uh, I'm going to call up Sharon Keeley, Leslie Jones, and Linda Alexander for general public comment, please. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your patience. I know oh. it's been a long meeting. Yeah, we're into the evening hours. Go right ahead. Sharon? So Sharon Keeley, Leslie Jones, Linda Alexander, please. I am Sharon Keeley. I'm a longtime St. Pedro resident. Um, please, I need order in the room, please. Can you start your time over again, please? We're asking for $2 million to get this jail opened. That's $10 per capita, 200,000 people down in the harbor area. It's nothing. It's a no-brainer. I'm sorry, for what? $2 million to get the jail open in St. Pedro. Oh. Uh, we live in a, it's for the Harbor Division. There are about 200,000 residents down there. It's a high crime area. Uh, we had three shootings just last Thursday night. Two young men aged 20 died. Another was shot in the back. It, we really need to get the jail operational down there. Right now, the cops are very, very thin on the ground. They can only react to the most violent of crime. They can't be proactive. They can't even react to the very simple crimes that get police attention immediately in other neighborhoods. Uh, so we would really be very grateful to you to get this jail open. Thank you. Uh, okay, our next speaker is Leslie Jones, followed by Linda Alexander, followed by Mona Sutton. Mr. Chair, I am also here to talk to you about opening up the Harvard Div Division Jail. Um, we were promised over 36 um, months ago from our mayor and our previous chief that our jail would be open. We built a uh, wonderful jail and facility down there over 10 years ago, and now it's become antiquated. Um, our officers have to leave our harbor area, San Pedro, Wilmington, Harbor Gateway, and Harbor City to transport anybody that's arrested to downtown. That's a 40-mile turnaround um, back and forth to take our officers off the street. Um, we would hope that you would continue with this promise that was promised to the citizens of the harbor area so we can help curb some of the activity that has been taking place down there, which she had just mentioned about the, the killings. So please, could you please help fund? Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Linda Alexander, followed by Mona Sutton, followed by Sunny Lopez. Linda Alexander, past president of the Central San Pedro Neighborhood Council, and I uh, have a little experience in, in, in the patients you've had all day in this long meeting. Uh, speaking about the LA uh, Harbor Jail, we need your help to open the jail. Fulfilling the promises made to our harbor community 
by the city, this broken promise continues to erode the community's faith and trust in our local government. As neighborhood council president, I was involved in many discussions regarding the jail. Please support Chief Moore, who has budgeted for the adjustments needed at the jail to open and uh, staff this facility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Mona Sutton, followed by Sunny Lopez, followed by Monica Sunseth. Um, good afternoon, uh, council members. Um, I'm Mona Sutton. Um, I, too, am a former neighborhood council uh, president as well as the current um, representative to LAPD of South Bureau and uh, community advocate. And when you hear my voice today, I'll tell you that I speak for the voices of many of the 200,000 residents um, of the harbor area and all four corners. Uh, I've been super embedded and uh, have advocated for not just but the jail, but we had two of of the biggest pro-police rallies that have ever, uh, that the city has ever seen. Pro-police and the fact that um, we want to help them help us. They've made a promise to us to, uh, to serve us, but unfortunately we're failing um, of not having our jail open. Um, we are at this point, uh, uh, the time has already run out just about on the, uh, the three-year promise by uh, Mayor Garcetti that he's made as well as uh, former Chief Beck. Uh, our current Michael Moore, uh, the Chief of Police, it's on his uh, budget, um, and he, we were supporting him and his action uh, to put it forward, and we, uh, we want you to support us and, and public safety for our people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Sunny Lopez, followed by Monica Sunseth, followed by uh, George Matthews. Good afternoon. I'm Sunny Lopez. I am... Uh, the niece, the goddaughter, and the ex-wife of law enforcement officers. So I have a vested interest in them. I'm a resident of San Pedro, so I have a vested interest in my community. Um, due to Mike Fuhrer addressing lawsuits with his own personal bias, our officers are no longer able to enforce many of the laws. Many of them. Compounding this due to Eric Garcetti with his own personal bias, our $40 million jail still sits empty. This means our officers have to drive all the way to Watts, take him off the streets for a full day often. Um, causes our officers basically to be inept at doing what they're supposed to do. Our community has become lawless. We have shootings constantly. We have crime. Our officers have been emasculated. They're not allowed to do their job. So I'm asking you, you know, to do the right thing here. Help our officers, help our community, open our jail. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Monica Sunseth, followed by George Matthews, followed by Celia Gonzalez. Hi, I'm a community member of the, that's covered by the Harbor Division, Monica Sunseth. I'm also a victim of crime, and it's been very devastating for me. I'm in regular contact with the LAPD detective that worked on my case. Uh, things keep pro cropping up, even though it happened five and a half years ago with the individuals that perpetrated this crime. And I feel very unsafe. I'm a single woman. I'm a flight attendant. I travel a lot. And I come home at all hours of the day and night. I fear for my personal safety. I, I don't have a choice of coming home at all days of the night, you know, all hours of the day and night. I have a police officer that's a neighbor, an LAPD officer, and the LAPD detective that works in my case, they, do, they try to really do their best, but they are hamstrung. They feel that they can't ar arrest the people they need to arrest. They're unsafe when they leave the field. They leave their officers unsafe as well as the community. Please open that jail. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is George Matthews, followed by Celia Gonzalez, followed by Grant Reed. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I'll thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. My name is George Matthews from the San Pedro CPR cleanup crew, Caring Proactive Residents. We are a group of volunteers that work in conjunction with LAPD and Port Police where we go into the so-called homeless camps, which are actually vagrant criminals who don't want to change. These are the people that we see over and over again that go to the bathroom in people's yards, breaking the cars constantly, and I'm finding this around school, syringes all over the place, and the police say, well, we can't take time out to get these guys because we have to take them all the way to L.A. Please help us out. We'll do our best for our city. We love our police force, and we want them to be out doing their job, not cleaning out 
vagrant camps. We want them out there arresting people and doing the best they can. I love our city, I love our police force, and I'm sure you guys want the best for them also. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Celia Gonzalez, followed by Grant Reed, followed by Sadie Wild. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for hearing us. My name is Celia Gonzalez. I'm a lifetime resident of San Pedro. I've watched it change dramatically over the years for the good because our shipping and we've had a lot of business that have moved in, for the bad because crime has wheels and it's found us, and uh, because to a certain degree where we're not prepared with any sort of laws or legislation, we've had a lot of crime that's come and uh, flourished. And as people have become homeless, they have branched out from where they first started in Old Downtown up into the outer community. They've literally spread out, and now we have people who follow them who are not just looking for haven because they have no home, but because they're following these people to where they're safe so they can attack them in the extended communities. So without this jail, as you have heard already, we are lacking uh, a lot of coverage, and I have remarks here and I'm running out of time, but uh, we are unprepared for what we have going here. And uh, the bigger picture is for all the good that we have, the crime that is followed, but to have met the officers finally at the CPAP meetings and to realize how much PTSD will follow them because they are short, so short-staffed because of their having to be stretched Thank so you. thin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Grant Reed, followed by Sadie Wild, file, followed by Liz Mickelson. Good afternoon. Grant Reed, Vice President of the Harbor City Neighborhood Council. Um, Mr. Krikorian, fund and open our jail. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, our next speaker is Sadie Wild, followed by Liz Mickelson, followed by James Diamond. Hi. Hi. We need money to open our bank in San Pedro. <laughs> I'm in jail, sorry. Bye. Thank you. Good job. Okay. Uh, our next speaker is Liz Michelson, followed by James Diamond, followed Good by... Good after... Oops, sorry. I stepped on your line. That's okay. Followed by James Baeza. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Jacob. Jacob, just say hi. <laughs> um, hold on. Sorry, I lost my... I lost my place. Um, my name is Liz Mickelson. I'm a 40-year resident of San Pedro. Uh, there's been a lot of changes in San Pedro over the last 40 years. Right up there at the top is the population growth, and with population growth comes growth in crime as well. San Pedro is the home to the Los Angeles port that you see up there on the wall. It's also the largest port in the Western Hemisphere. Um, we need our jail open. There's a lot of development going on right now that is going to make San Pedro a major uh, recreation and entertainment destination. Uh, the um, San Pedro Public Market has plans for a 6,000 seat amphitheater. We need uh, an open jail in San Pedro because of all of the activity that's going to be coming our way. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is James Diamond, uh, before, followed by James Baeza, followed by William Preston Bowling. Uh, before my time starts, I just want to say, after sitting here for four hours, it's nice to see our city work. Thank you. Uh, my name is James Diamond, past president of Coastal Neighbor Council, chairman of public safety, graduate of Citizens Police Academy 1 and 2, four-year member of Citizens Police Academy uh, Executive Committee, and also a recent graduate of Citizens Harbor on Patrol. I'm going to speak on behalf of our officers. What makes Harbor Division unique is we are an island. We are the only division where another division does not directly abut us. If there is an emergency in the harbor area, other officers have to travel 20 plus miles for assistance. The reason we need the jail open is if your responsibility was patrol that night, gentlemen, you do not want your partner 22 miles away if an emergency happens. You want your partner at Harbor Division Jail where he can leave that prisoner, get out and back you up. Now, Port Police and Harbor Division will both use this jail. They are both responsible for the safety and security of the Port of LA. 
I think it's time that we do the responsible thing and open that jail, but most importantly, support our officers of both divisions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is, is there anybody here named Georgima? I think that was just a typo. That was a typo. That was a typo. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so that would be, uh, our next speaker will be James Baeza, followed by William Preston Bowling, Bowling um, followed by Ruth uh, Luevanos. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for your time. I am a member of the Community Police Advisory Board and have served on neighborhood councils in our community for, for some years now. Um, you know, three years ago, Chief Beck came to our town and stood in front of about 1,400 people and said that in 36 months, he and the mayor would be certain that our jail would be open and everything would be funded. The jail's been there for about 10 years and all the equipment has failed and, and whatnot. There's been no maintenance going on. As James Diamond said, we're essentially an island, a 28 square mile island of about 210,000 people. The most important thing to us is officer hours. And the trip down to 77th Street is taking, you know, um, it's a two hour round trip on a good day, according to our senior lead officers down in the Harbor Division. And it was also mentioned that, uh, you know, there's no crossover. You gotta scream down the freeway for support or for extra officers if we should have a, uh, you know, a large incident take place. And, and if I could, I'd just like to say that the $912,000 for support staff, jailers, supervisors, and then another, say, million dollars to bring the jail up to code with the state of California and whatnot is what we're looking for, and we'd like Mayor Garcetti to do that for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is William Preston Bowling still here? I don't think I, s okay. Uh, is there anybody else named William, no last name? Okay. Uh, then that would bring up Ruth Luevanos, followed by Charlize, followed by Whitney Beatty. Do you have Allison Boat down there at all? Uh, well, it's a long list. I think some of these people were on the other matter and they pushed this number by mistake. So uh, I have Allison Vote. Vote? Okay. Uh, Gail Fleury. Oh, yay. Gail's here. Gail. Yeah. And, and just so that I have it, is there, is Ruth Luevanos here? I think she was on the previous matter, so, okay. All right, Ms. Vogt and Ms. Okay. Fleury. Well, as you know, I'm Allison Vogt. I'm a member of the, and past board member of the Central San Peter Neighborhood Council, uh, the NJP, the CRT, the Executive Board of the CPAB, and also uh, one of the first classes of the HCOP with the Harbor Division. I'm here in support of opening the jail. As you know, San Pedro is a nice little city in this, uh, down south, uh, connected only to LA by the uh, 110 freeway. Currently, our law enforcement resources are stretched and our police department is forced to contend with stopgap measures when enforcing the laws. Our officers are tasked with servicing over 26 square miles, and when there's an arrest, they have to go to the 77th Division, which takes them off, off the street. Um, it, it, it affects the uh, safety of the community. It's been over a decade since the jail facilities opened and much public, too much public fanfare, and then nothing. Our stakeholders have rallied and demanded the facility be open and the powers that be promised us three years ago that we'd have the jail open. It's now been three years, and we ask that the funding be come, uh, come forth for us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Gail Fleury. And again, is there a Charlize here? <coughs> is there a Whitney Beatty? Okay. Kristen Lovell? Uh, yeah, I think these are all from before. Okay, Ms. Fleury. Thank you. Um, Gail Fleury, stakeholder. Uh, San Pedro is a destination city. It's at the end of the earth, and you have to have a reason to go there. We have lots of reasons to go there. We have the cruise ships that come in and out. We have the Catalina Express. We have the Iowa. We have the new public market coming in. We have Crafted, Alta Sea. We've got a lot going on. That means that we have a lot of tourists that come in there, a lot. And when you have that many tourists, you want them to be safe. Right now, the cruise ships don't want their passengers wandering through San Pedro because it's not safe. We would like to make a safe place, not only for the tourists that come, but for the citizens of San Pedro as well. Please, please help us with the jail, with getting it open and having enough money for refurbishment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I've got a lot of names on here, folks, that, that I think are by mistake. So I'm just going to run through them. If I get to your name, just come on up and just let me know your name when you speak, please. John Kopsinski, Adam Vine. Energy, left. Vanessa, no last name. 
Okay. Uh, Lynn Lyman. Rick Ross. Bill Watkins. Yes. Okay, come on up. Jasmine Aguiar, I see. And Mr. Previn, I saw you, but I don't see you on the list. Did you want to speak as well? Okay. Um, you're not on the list. What do you mean? What do I mean? <laughs> you're not on the list. Okay, so uh, go ahead. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening. My name is John Kopsinski. I am a, a board member of the Coastal San Pedro Neighborhood Council. I'm here today speaking as a resident of San Pedro. Um, it's, it's a long way from San Pedro to LAPD 77th Street Division, the nearest jail. Uh, 40 miles round trip to be exact, the same distance from LA City Hall to the Ontario Airport. Um, our community needs your help to open the jail and we ask that you finally fulfill the promises made by the mayor to, and the former police chief. Uh, $2 million is needed to open the jail. This is less than one quarter of 1% of the city's total proposed budget of $10 billion for the next fiscal year. At the end of the day, this is not just a budget issue, but a public safety issue, and who can put a price on that? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bill Watkins, followed by uh, Jasmine Aguiar, followed by Eric Previn. Good afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks for the respectful meeting, and I appreciate the Sergeant of Arms and City Attorney if they're here, and anyone who's made this meeting a, a nice meeting. I was pretty angry a couple weeks ago when female members of Maine City Council were abused uh, once again, and so I just really appreciate the tone of this meeting. My issue is um, the sidewalk cleaning initiative, and I hope to see that back on agenda uh, to get funding. I think there's a pilot program uh, in budget, as I, as I understand, uh, December, I think it was tabled uh, for a future date to debate the next phase. I just support the initiative. I support uh, job opportunities for homeless and formerly homeless. I'm formerly homeless, great education, but I screwed up. And my, my resume is pretty shoddy. And I just like to clean. I love to clean this city. And I hope we can get rid of the loopholes to um, just get a lot of people jobs. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Aguiar, followed by Mr. Previn. Hello. Um, my name is Jasmine Aguiar. I am an activist advocate in the cannabis industry, and um, we just had a conversation about $1.5 million being allocated to the cannabis industry for some of these reparations. And now we're having a conversation about $2 million for a gel in Harbor City, which is not needed. The Harbor City um, Social Equity Program does not exist. None of the zip codes within Wilmington, San Pedro have been analyzed for the Social Equity Program. So I cannot grasp my head around how are we going to allocate funds to imprison more people instead of providing them services and resources to empower our communities to do better. Um, I urge uh, the committee to take a look at these budgets and reanalyze what it was presented and really take a look into the social equity analysis report and open it up so that cities like Wilmington can benefit instead of be continually harmed. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Previn. Thank you. It's Eric Previn from CD2 up here in uh, this part of the, the city. <clears throat> the budget meetings are coming up and I, I wanted to um, reference that we you know, these departments have a lot of complications. So when we hear input from the communities like we did today, someone mentioned it was a, respect, a respectful meeting, we should really take the time to hear for, uh, for each department. We should get a chance, the public, to speak for one minute. There are 25 or 30 departments maybe, but that's over a number of days. It's important because the current practice or the prior practice, whatever you want to call it, is insane. It's where you speak at the very beginning and then, lo and behold, days or weeks later, who the hell knows what happened. We need to make it accurate and responsive. I also just want to correct the record that there are instances where the city <clears throat> rolls over money, like with the neighborhood councils, where we made that big crew and cry so that now if you don't spend your full 42,000 allotment, you can roll over up to 10,000. So I think that's important. And finally, I just would ask the city attorney to look at the conflict of interest between waste management. If they're not going to participate in any Santa Susana, so be it. But Greg Smith shouldn't be going around making recommendations when it looks like waste management, the firm he worked for, is going to be a potential recipient of any cleanup. It smells to high heaven. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, are there any other speakers that I missed? Okay. Is there any other business before uh, the, the committee? Yeah, sir. All right. Uh, thank you all very much for a terrific job today and for your patience. We are adjourned.